Welcome to episode 22 of the Imperial Tides podcast. Uh, I'm Holden, and I'm joined today by my co-host, Simone. And today we're going to be talking about Andrei Rublev, uh, 1966, one of Andre, the great Andrei Tarkovsky's uh, opuses. You know, well, He's done a lot of pretty good stuff, and this is one of those pretty good things. And so uh, before we get into the discussion for today's episode, I'm going to start off with a, a synopsis. And because this is a a pretty long movie, it's three hours, um, and, you know, because there's kind of a lot to get to in it, the synopsis might be pretty long, so, uh, just bear with me as I I go through it, there are, uh, there's a lot to get to, so the synopsis might be a little longer than it would be in, in other, uh, episodes, but just, um, that being said, uh, let's just, let's dive right in, so, um, the movie, so Andrei Rublev, uh, the film is essentially a series of loosely connected vignettes uh, covering various events in the life of one Andrei Rublev. Andrei is a notable painter in 15th century Russia. He is a monk who paints icons. Uh, the film is set more or less over a span of 24 years. There are nine distinct sections, uh, the prologue, the jester, which uh, takes place in summer 1400, uh, Theophanes, the Greek, which takes place in uh, from you know, from summer, winter, spring, summer, so a year uh, between the years of 1405 to 1406. Then there is the Passion, which is set in uh, 1406. Uh, the Holiday, set in 1408. The Last Judgment, sent in set in summer 1408, and the Raid, uh, set in autumn 1408. There is Silence, set in winter 1412, so now we've jumped ahead four years. And then there is the Bell, uh, Spring, which is set uh, in spring, summer, winter, spring, another year, uh, from the years of 1423 to 1424. And then there is the Epilogue. Everything except the Epilogue is uh, shot in black and white. So um, we'll we'll go over each uh, individual chapter. We'll break them down one at a time. So uh, the Prologue. So, uh, but just to reiterate, I guess, just to go through it again, uh, there is the the prologue, the jester, Theophanes, the Greek, uh, the passion, the holiday, the last judgment, the raid, silence, and the bell, and the epilogue. Okay. And uh, so, the the prologue, let's, let's just start with the prologue. The prologue, uh, let's, so let's see here. The film begins with a man going on a hot air balloon ride. Uh, the cinematography is done in a way that allows the viewer to feel as though they are on the hot air balloon as well. Uh, the balloon flies high in the sky. Uh, the man riding it is happy, but not long after, uh, it, it begins to rapidly descend because it's running out of air, and, and the man lands face first in a puddle of mud in the marshlands. Uh, the ride is over. The jester... Uh, set in summer, the jester or summer 1400. Uh, we are introduced to uh, Andre Rublev. Uh, one day, Andre Rublev is with two other monks, uh, Kirill and Daniil. And as they are making their, or which are, that's the Romanized or the the Russian uh, equivalent of of uh, I guess Cyril and Daniel. So Kirill and Daniil. Uh, and Andrei Rublev, the three of them, are making their way through the countryside uh, when it begins to rain. So they seek shelter in a wooden communal house or a barn where a jester of the time called a, uh, let me just make sure I'll pronounce this uh, right, Skomorik. Uh, so this this is a Russian, medieval Russian jester, uh, and he's called a Skomorik, right? Uh, th- this Skomorik is performing for his fellow peasants in this barn. And uh, after his performance ends, the three monks make their appearance and ask to be let in so they can wait out the rain. Uh, the Skamoric allows them to, but is on edge right away. Uh, at this time Skimor- at this time in history, uh, Skamorics are not allowed to perform. They're not allowed to be Skamorics because um, they're, they're politically controversial, you know. And the Skamoric just, this Skamoric right here, he just got finished um, kind of insulting the, uh, the, the Boyar and, and the Boyarinas who are... Um, they're there. They were essentially the members of the old aristocracy in Russia of the time. They are next to rank in, in, in princes and let's say princesses. So, um, they're pretty, you know, they're, they're pretty important. And this Skomorik here, uh, 
Well, it says here that, you know, so it's not, if you want a little more information, they're basically medieval East Slavic uh, harlequins or actors who uh, could also sing, dance, play musical instruments, and compose for oral, musical, and uh, dramatic performances. And the, uh, the Russian Orthodox Church uh, often railed against them and other elements of popular culture as being irreverent, uh, detracting from the worship of God, or being downright diabolical. And so, you know, they were kind of, they, it wasn't good to be a Skomoric back in the day. And so, um, because of the authoritarian church, right? And so, uh, and the prevailing zeitgeist of the time, right? And so, yes, uh, it, they, they're not allowed to perform. It is against the dictates of the Russian Orthodox Church, and uh, skamorics are severely punished if found and caught. Uh, the three monks rest. Uh, Kirill gets up to stretch his legs. Uh, a mentally handicapped man attempts to attack three soldiers as they search through a house near the communal shelter or the barn, but misses every time. Uh, you know, like he goes to hit one of them with a, with a log, but he just he falls over and, you know, he does that like three or four times. He misses every single time. Uh, the soldiers make their way to the barn and single out the Skamoric. Uh, the Skamoric implies, it complies. He gets up and follows them. And, and from there he is quickly knocked unconscious and put onto one of the horses, the soldiers, uh, uh, horses and carried off to an unknown fate. Uh, from there, the three monks leave. Uh, and then the sequence ends. Uh, the next chapter is uh, Theophanes the Greek, which takes place in uh, for, from you know summer, winter, spring, summer, 1405 to 1406. Uh, there is a man named Theophanes the Greek who is looking for someone to help him paint a cathedral. He mistakes uh, Kirill for Andrei Rublev, who is uh, famous. He's known around Russia for being this uh, this great artistic talent. Uh, Kirill is not as gifted, however, but but as a monk, he is uh, literate and educated. And uh, Theophanes is impressed by this and offers to give Kirill a job. Uh, Kirill turns down his offer at first, but then instructs Theophanes to send for him at his monastery as a way to show the other monks that he's wanted and not as mediocre as they think he is. Uh, however, what ends up happening uh, because of this is that a, a messenger visits the monastery on Theophanes' uh, behalf, requesting that uh, Andrei Rublev come and paint the cathedral instead. Uh, the implication being here may be that uh, Theophanes didn't like how um, kind of self-aggrandizing uh, Kirill was. He he didn't like that Kirill wanted to have a whole show and a whole performance made of you know he didn't want it to he didn't like how Kirill wanted to make the you know make getting a job uh, uh, as a you know a painter or whatever being chosen to paint something a, a big deal. He, so maybe Theophanes didn't like that uh, Kirill wasn't humble, and maybe that's why he chose uh, Rublev instead. Um, uh, so yeah, Andre is selected to uh, paint the cathedral with uh, Theophanes instead, and, and Kirill is hurt by this and decides to leave the monastery altogether, leaving in a storm of rage and bitter jealousy. Uh, Daniil feels the same way, but to a lesser extent, and actually reconciles with Andre not uh, not long after kind of getting into an argument with him. Uh, but Kirill, however, uh, does allow his bitterness and jealousy to burn his bridges with the monastery, and so he is cut loose. He is no longer a monk. He leaves for good and uh, seemingly beats his dog to death uh, on the way out because his dog tries to follow him, and he, he turns around and beats it with a stick because he's, you know, he's mad and, he, and he's just... And then that's how the sequence ends, right? The, the sequence ends with the dog kind of yelling out in pain, and, and, we're, and it's, it's implied that it dies. Um, the next section from there is, uh, the next chapter from there is The Passion, which is set in 1406. Uh, Andre is with his apprentice uh, named Foma, and they are in the woods somewhere. Uh, Andre is lecturing Foma about his flaws. He doesn't like that Foma lies and, uh, you know, eats too much. Uh, he doesn't think... Uh, Foma is very talented when it comes to painting either, and there's a bit of conflict between, I guess, the technical and intellectual aspects of painting and creativity because Foma is more interested, as a painter, he is more interested in, like, mixing colors and everything. He wants to mix azure, which is, like, the color of the, a blue sky, basically, blue sky. He wants to, uh, to mix, he wants to figure out how to, fi how to mix um, azure. He cares more about that than he does, I guess, the, the significance of what they're painting, I guess, the religious aspect of it, the spiritual aspect of it, you know, because they, they paint icons, right? So they're painting images of Christ and, and you know, Mary and Mary Magdalene and uh, the apostles and all that, these biblical scenes and whatnot. And, and uh, Andre doesn't feel as though um, Foma is uh, really in tune with that as much as he should be. He doesn't really appreciate um, the technical aspects the way that Foma does. And so there's a, a bit of this conflict. Um Foma has also been stung by a bee, uh, and he, he, there's a moment where he comes across a snake in a stream and makes half-hearted attempts at uh, poking it. Uh, not long after, they run into Theophanes, who has uh, ants crawling over his bare feet for some reason. 
uh, and Theophanes and Andre get into an argument about Jesus Christ and the New Testament as uh, Foma washes paintbrushes in the river, um, which is another, again, another bit of a visual metaphor seeing, you know, because again, Foma cares more about the technical, the material, the concrete, I guess. He's, he isn't really interested in these big questions about religion, whereas the other two are. And so Theophanes and Andre, I think they're getting into an argument. I, I didn't write this down, but as far as I can remember, they get into an argument about um, whether or not there's any good in the world and, and what, what the best way to follow Jesus' Jesus's example would be. And they, they get into a bit of an argument about that. And I think uh, Andre says something about how um, the, even the people who killed Jesus loved him because um, that was predestined from the start, because God put Jesus on earth to die so that human beings would realize their, you know, their sins or whatever, and and um, have a, have a reason, I guess, have an excuse to um, to repent for them. And so that was basically what he was arguing. Andre was making an argument for a predestination, whereas Theophanes disagreed on certain some certain points. Uh, I can't exactly remember, um, but um, the film then cuts from there to a sort of reenactment of Christ's crucifixion. You get a bit of a passion play, hence the title of the chapter, uh, "The Passion." And uh, the only difference, however, what's unique about it is that the characters and setting are distinctly Russian. So it's not, it, the, the, the passion play doesn't pretend to be set in, um, you know, in Jerusalem or, or, you know, the Middle East or any, anything like that. It, it's Russian. All the actors are Russian. Uh, they're, it's, it's set against the backdrop of snow. You know, it looks like Siberia. So it's, it's very much very Russian. And I, I think there's something to be said about that. Um, and from there, uh, we go to the next chapter, which is called The Holiday, and that is set in 1408, uh, two years after uh, The Passion, which was set again in 1406. Uh, now, in The Holiday in 1408, Andre and Foma and the rest of his painting crew are traveling in another uh, through, through another uh, rural setting when Andre hears noises in the distance. Uh, he takes off to find out what those noises are and ends up stepping into a massive village-wide uh, orgy or pagan holiday. Uh, men and women alike are running around naked, playing in the river and having sex with each other, uh, and Andre is caught by three men who tie him up to keep him from attempting to convert them to his faith. Uh, he is then approached by a naked woman who tries to seduce him and explain to him why they're doing what they're doing. And, and uh, their conversation helps Andre to kind of realize a little more uh, about like, you know, his position as a, uh, it makes him more aware about his position as a monk. It makes him realize that uh, the religion of the time is a little too persecutive, you know, it's a little too persecuting. And there's, there's a lot to be said about that. I mean, one of the themes of the story is that, uh, one of the themes of the film is that, um, Ironically enough, what what ends up happening is that uh, these these monks, you know, these these people who try to follow uh, Jesus's example, end up becoming more like the people who persecuted Jesus back in the day, because they are a little too harsh in their um, in their beliefs, and they're not willing to compromise or or, or look. Uh, they're not open to other people's perspectives, and so that's kind of what the scene does. It kind of shakes his faith a little bit. It makes him question what he's really doing as a, as a both a monk and an icon painter, and as a as a man of God. Uh, it kind of puts that all into question uh, somewhat. And so uh, the the girl, the naked woman, explains this to him, or at least tries to, and then she tries to uh, to, to kiss him, but he rejects her advances and uh, begs her to untie him, uh, which she does, and from there he takes off. Uh, the next morning he returns to his crew, he, a bit scratched and bruised from wandering through the, the thicket all night. Uh, but, but he's not, th that, that physical aspect isn't as, you know, of pain or whatever. That's not as important to, as, as the fact that he's shaken. He, he's, you know, he's mentally, intellectually, uh, ideologically shaken by what he has, uh, come upon more so than anything else. Uh, and as he and his crew row off for their destination, they end up passing a, a by a, a scene in which a, a man and woman, uh, which, and it, and it turns out that the woman is actually the same woman who was talking to Andre the night before, uh, they are being uh, harassed by a group of people, uh, seemingly for participating in the orgy and being, you know, pagans and not being part of the, the Christian faith at the time. Um, the man is caught, uh, but the woman manages to swim off into the river. They're being attacked by a group of soldiers, I believe. So soldiers, these are soldiers attacking them. The man gets caught by the soldiers, but the woman manages to swim off into the river. And uh, the sequence ends with a shot of her slowly moving farther and farther into the distance from where the camera is, doing everything she can to escape uh, persecution. Uh, and she's naked, and she passes right by the uh, the monk's boats, Andre's boat. And uh, the monks kind of turn away in shame. They try to ignore it as best as they can. But they they even they they know that you know they know that there's something very wrong. 
wrong about the whole situation and they kind of, it, you know, it makes them very uncomfortable. It unnerves them, you know, it unsettles them. It shakes them a little bit. Uh, the next chapter after that is The Last Judgment, set in uh, summer 1408. And uh, Andre and his crew are working on some sort of construction project. They are, uh, they are well, they're, they're painting a cathedral. And uh, Andre is missing, so progress uh, progress isn't being made. And there's a messenger from the prince who's yelling at the crew to kind of get their shit done, or else the prince will kill them or, or something, you know. Um, Andre is that so he's gone. He's missing. Foma is getting mad. Uh, they they want to know where Andre is. They have no idea where he is. Uh, Andre is actually in, in the nearby countryside, arguing with uh, Daniel about not wanting to use fear as a recruitment tactic for the religious faith because what they've been uh, assigned to paint is like some sort of doom and gloom, you know, fire and brimstone uh, Christian imagery to try to scare people into um, converting to Christianity and going to church more often and stuff. He doesn't like the idea of using fear as a, as a means to an end. He doesn't, he wants to inspire people, not, not scare them into submission, basically. And so, um, and yeah, he doesn't want to scare people into believing in God and living like Christ. Uh, it just doesn't go, just doesn't bode well with him. And we're, we're assuming that this is because Again, he doesn't. He he took he he took to heart what happened, uh, you know, in the holiday with the woman. He, he that kind of got him thinking a little more, and so he doesn't want to, to you know he doesn't want to persecute people in any sort of way. Um, and so instead, uh, he wants to inspire them. He wants it to be more positive. Uh, so then it cuts back to the, uh, from there it cuts back to the, uh, the construction site where Foma decides to leave because he's fed up with the way that Andre treats him and, and does not consider painting to be a real occupation because again, he, he, he likes sort of the practical concrete, like material aspects of work. He doesn't like, uh, and, and you know, Andre didn't see that with him. So they didn't see eye to eye on it. Uh, and he doesn't feel like he's being appreciated or valued enough. And so he wants to go off and do some, what, what he would consider to be, you know, quote unquote, real work, something that he can, you know, get his hands dirty with or, or whatever. Um, and so then he leaves, he, he asks if anyone else wants to come with him, but they don't. And so the rest of the crew members stay. From there, Andre ends up completing the project, but uh, but makes it bright and white and heavenly. Uh, the, the church is built, uh, the cathedral is beautiful and full of doves and it's, uh, and you know, there, there's this royal family who comes to visit, and um, and yeah, Andre and his crew are still there. The the royal family are visiting though, and Andre plays blissfully with a a little girl who um, who splashes milk in his face and is an embodiment of innocence. Uh, some of the members of the the royal family, or, or whoever they are, um, or wait, well, no, no, sorry, sorry. Um, so yeah, Andre's playing with this girl, and it, it's it's a good time. You know, life is good. Life is is good. Uh, this is, it's sort of like a heaven on earth. The cathedral is like a, a little slice of Eden, let's say. And, uh, there's this royal family there and, um, there are the, you know, the, the members of, some of the members of, uh, Andre's crew, like the stone cutters and the people who are built, or, you know, like the stone masons, the people who helped build it and kind of shape everything. The artists, basically, the other artists, they decide to go off in, into the woods and, uh, and then they're approached by a man on a horse and, uh, the man motions for one of them to come close to him, uh, and the that the the other man does. The person does. He comes close to him, and and when he does, uh, the man on the horse holds their head in like an arm lock and, and gouges their eyes out with a knife. And uh, several other horse riders then appear and blind the other members of the group as well. And um, one of the boys in Andre's crew comes upon the scene and sees that everyone is either blind or dead. Uh, and to top it all off, uh, the film cuts to a shot of milk pouring out into a stream. Uh, and uh, I, I think that's the movie indirect, reve revealing indirect, indirectly or, or um, implying that the, uh, the little girl has been murdered uh, by these, these people. And, um, yeah, well, and we, then you, I guess you kind of find out through the, the dialogue that uh, the reason why this has happened is because um, the people, the, the crew that the part of on the, the part of Andre's crew that helped him design the cathedral, uh, they basically didn't do a good job. According to the prince, the prince of Russia was not ha the grand prince of Russia was not happy with the result, and so um, he wanted them to redo it. And they refused to redo it because they liked what how it turned out. Because again, the grand prince asked he he had commissioned them, he paid them to make something that was um, persecutive. I guess they want he wanted them to do something that would scare. Uh, people into uh, converting to the Christian faith as opposed to inspire them. He didn't like that. He didn't like that he didn't that they that Andre and the others didn't listen to uh, uh, what what he 
you know, didn't do what he wanted them to do. He didn't like that they were being creatively free, right? And so um, the crew are, you know, they, they were a bit belligerent and they basically said that they were going to go paint the prince's brothers. They were going to design uh, like a mansion for the prince's brother who was kind of like the prince's rival as well. The brothers are rivals, sibling rivalry. Um, and so they were going to go basically do a really great job with the, the prince's brother's uh, mansion, his construction project, because they didn't like that the, the grand prince himself was trying to force them to do something that they didn't want to do uh, artistically and creatively. Uh, and so because of that, the prince sent some men to blind the, uh, the, the, the stone cutters and the creators and I guess kill the kid apparently or, or whatever. Um, I don't, I don't know if he, they killed the kid or not, but um, the milk it obviously represents sort of an end of innocence for uh, Andre personally, because it's from that this point forward that he realizes that the world's a pretty harsh place. You know, he kind of it, it's the first time he's exposed to violence of this degree and intensity in, in nature. Um, so yeah, they're all blind, and, and it's it's you know it's it's pretty fucked up. And uh, this this sequence ends with uh, a mentally handicapped girl wandering into the church to seek shelter from the rain and uh, getting upset by a splotch of paint that uh, Andre has thrown onto a white wall in his grief at, at finding out that, you know, pretty much most of it, you know, the majority of his crew has just been blinded for uh, not listening to what the, the prince, you know, told them, I guess. And so it, it bugs him, uh, as it would anyone, I'm assuming. Um, the next chapter after that is The Raid, which is set in uh, autumn of uh, 1408. Uh, the village where the church is, is, uh, or, or maybe it's not the village where the church is. It's, uh, I think it's Vladimir. So the village of Vladimir is, is attacked by a group of, uh, by a band of savage Tatars, Tatars, sorry, a band of savage Tatars who are, you know, a military entity. Um, they pillage everything, uh, slaughter countless innocents and end up raiding the church. Uh, Foma is actually killed from an arrow to the, you know, he takes an arrow to the back and dies. Uh, he's killed by one of uh, a totter uh, archer. Um, meanwhile, Andre and the uh, the handicapped girl they're they're in the church uh, as as it's being broken into, and the totters are just killing everyone left and right. Uh, Andre is forced to uh, to bludgeon. Actually, he's actually forced to bludgeon a totter to death with an axe in order to protect the handicapped girl in order to keep her from being assaulted. And um, uh, and so the Tatars, they kill everybody. Uh, there is also a part where I didn't write this down. So excuse me if I sound a little improvisational when I try to explain this, but there's a part where, um, uh, in this chapter where, uh, well, it turns out that the reason why the Tatars are attacking Vladimir is because the prince's brother is trying to kind of take over Russia or, you know, trying to, uh, do something. He's trying to start shit because, um, he and his brother are rivals, you know, and, uh, and there's a point where um, I believe it's like the, the priest's assistant or something asks uh, the prince's brother, like, why he's doing what he's doing. And then he, he accuses the, you know, he says, he tells the prince, he's like, you've betrayed Russia. You know, you've, you've betrayed your own people uh, out of, for greed. And it's like, you know, you should be ashamed of yourself. And, and you see that the, the prince's brother is really guilty. He feels guilty about um, doing this. But he, he, and so it's like even him who is, you know, caused all this chaos, killed all these innocent people and stuff. He feels guilty about it. You know, he feels guilty about selling out his own country and his own his own countrymen and his own you know his own people, his own culture for power uh, and for making this agreement with the Tatars who are not necessarily of the same culture. There, I think they. I, I don't exactly know. I, I didn't do research for this. I kind of wish that I did, but I was just kind of tired after writing out the the notes for this uh, episode. But um, the, I, I'm not sure if the Tatars are like the Russian equivalent of Mongols or if they are Mongols themselves. I don't know how they connect. But I well I do know obviously Russia is both in Europe and Asia so um, I, I'm assuming that the Tatars are more on the Asian side than they are on the uh, the European side and so maybe that's what um, the old the the uh, the the priest's assistant was talking about when he said that he betrayed his own culture his own people because again Russia is a huge place so it's like there are different regions and you know I'm sure different regions associate in different ways and whatnot and but anyway yeah so the uh, totters mongols totters are basically mongols unless they are like literally mongols but they in, in this movie they they fulfill the role similar to like i guess the mongols of like uh let's say like ghost of tsushima or you know nazis in schindler's list or uh come and see movies like that they're they are the the savage sadistic um oppressors who just fucking murder everybody and and you know pillage and and they're they're terrible people right you know or like the vikings you know just awful, awful people, monsters, you know, basically. 
uh, and and of their time as well. They're very medieval. They are very much medieval. They are what make the medieval period uh, medieval, to, to say the least. But um, yeah, so what ends up happening from there is that uh, Andre uh, is then... Uh, the, the chaos ends. Everyone's gone. Um, the priest's assistant gets really fucked over. He gets like a really shitty uh, deal in the end. They end up pouring like metal liquid from melted uh, from a melted crucifix into his mouth and like uh, tying him to the back of a horse so that the horse just carries him off and he's he's fucked. I mean he's dead, you know. Um, and everybody else is pretty much except for uh, Andre and the handicapped girl. And they uh, they the or the God's fool as they refer to her as, but you know I'll just call her the handicapped girl to be nice uh, and to be PC. But uh, so. From there, yeah, again, Andre and the handicapped girl, they're only, they're, they are the sole survivors of this incident. Uh, everything's quiet now. The carnage has kind of subsided, but it's still there. Uh, Andre's paintings and shit, his art has been ruined. Um, he's not, it's not a good time. You know, he doesn't feel good. Um, it, it, things aren't going great. Uh, and uh, during this, during this, this uh, I guess, how would you describe this interlude or, or you know, after the fact, uh, in the aftermath, he ends up, seeing what appears to be the spirit or, or like a vision of the dead Theophanes uh, or Theophanes. And they, uh, they have a conversation. And uh, in that conversation, Theophanes encourages him to hold on to his faith, despite the circumstances, in spite of what has just happened, you know, the de debilitating loss. Uh, and he, he encourages Andre to live in a state between forgiveness and uh, self-torment for the murder, you know, for the sin he committed. Even if it was in self-defense or whatever, he still you know, killed someone and that, that goes against the religion, right? And so Andre resolves from this point on to take a vow of silence and to no longer paint. Um, the next uh, chapter after that is fittingly titled uh, Silence, which uh, takes place in uh, winter of 1412. So four years after the events of uh, Vladimir, the, the Tatar raid on Vladimir. Um, Andre has been in silence for four years now. Uh, he is still with the handicapped girl, and they're both kind of sharing this silence together. Uh, and they're st they are no they're, they're back in the, the the monastery. So they're back in the monastery that um, Kirill left, uh, and I, I believe it's called the Andronovic. I'm, I'm gonna look it up. I'm I'm make sure I'm correct. I'm I'm right about it. Uh, yeah, the Andronikov, the Andronikov uh, monastery. And that is in. Uh, if you want to be, let's get specific here. It is a. It, it was. It's a. It was a monastery on the left bank of the Yauza River in uh, in Moscow, right? So that's where they are right now. They're not in Vladimir, um, which was the village that was attacked. And uh, let's see. Uh, so from there, uh, there's a famine right now. There's a famine going on. Uh, some of the other inhabitants of the the cathedral, Andronikov, uh, they they mock Andre for his silence. Uh, one man with a raspy voice tells a story about how he was forced to hide in a frozen lake in order to survive a totter attack. Uh, it turns out that th this is Kirill from before. He has uh, been disfigured to the point of being almost unrecognizable, almost completely unrecognizable. Uh, and he seeks redemption from the head monk uh, who grants it to him, but only if he goes back to being a monk himself and does like and writes um, the scripture like 15 times over or something like that. Uh, and uh, Kirill agrees. Uh, from there, Kirill tries talking to Andre, but Andre does not relent from his um, uh, from his vow of silence. Uh, he ignores him. Uh, he remains silent. And uh, from there, a then all of a sudden, a group of uh, totters show up to ridicule the uh, handicapped girl, and um, one of them ends up actually taking her on as a wife. Uh, and uh, the group leaves before Andre can successfully uh, bring her back. She was refusing to come with him anyway. She uh, didn't want to go. She 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 liked them, and she wanted to go with the the totter. And uh, she did, and um, it appears, you know, it appears that she wanted to leave. Uh, the sequence ends with Andre. Uh, well, the, sequ the sequence ends with Kirill basically reassuring, trying to reassure Andre that the the Totters wouldn't hurt a, a, a God's fool or a mentally handicapped person um, because it, it's against religion, right? And so, and even they are, they, they even they have beliefs, and um, yeah. And then from there, the sequence ends with Andre dropping a stone into the snow. By mistake, which uh, I, I'm assuming is a vis visual metaphor for failure. You know, his failure, um, his dormancy, I guess, his failure with with art and stuff at this point is kind of his, you know, his his retreat from from things and all that. Um, but we'll get into that later. Uh, the next chapter from there is called the Bell, and that takes place uh, from you know in uh, spring, summer, winter, spring, 
of uh, 1423 to 1424. Uh, so now we focus on a completely different character. This is there is a a, a boy named uh, Boris who has lost his entire family to a plague. Uh, he was the son of an esteemed bell maker, and uh, he has nowhere to go now because all his family is dead, and he doesn't really. The only thing he knows, kind of, kind of knows how to do is um, bell making, right? And so, um, uh, there's a group of people who have come to his house to ask for his father, but his dad's dead now because of the plague, but his dad was a, a very an esteemed bell maker, uh, and the people visiting him, they, they came because they needed his dad to make a new bell for the prince. The prince is requesting a new bell, uh, but Boris is the only one left, and so Boris begs them to take him so that he can construct the bell for the prince, uh, but at first the travelers refuse uh, until um, Boris claims that his father taught him a secret bell-making trick that only his family was aware of, and so... Um, because that 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 makes them because of that they decide to take him on but hesitantly and uh from there he spends a really long time looking for the right kind of clay to begin and uh, after the situation seems hopeless he ends up actually finding it and uh the process to create the bell then goes underway and uh Boris is a bit of a bad boss at first he he doesn't he doesn't know he, not knowing exactly what to do with regards to preparing for the bell and then also um unnecessarily punishing his workers for not being able to carry out his sort of weird contradictory impossible tasks um he's working himself to the bone and appears to be in and over his head and um he bumps into Andre at the construction site at one point but pays him little heed you know doesn't pay much attention to him and just kind of makes fun of his uh pokes fun at his silence um then uh during so you know as Boris is getting all of his workers and all of his men to kind of you know help make this to, you know to make the bell while he's directing all of his people uh Andre is attacked by a strange um worn down man who accuses him of getting him locked up for 10 years uh and it it turns out that this man is actually the uh Skamoric from earlier from uh, the very first well, not no, I guess not the first chapter. The first chapter would be the prologue, but I guess this, the the first main chapter, uh, the jester. So, uh, summer of fourteen hundred. Now it is um, now it is fourteen twenty three so, to to fourteen twenty four. So twenty three twenty three or twenty four years later, uh, this man is attacking Andre, uh, because he he blames Andre for um, getting him locked up, and it turns out that when it, what actually ended up happening to him, uh, this uh, this uh, Skamoric, I, I believe, is that how you pronounce it? Let me make sure yeah skamoric what ends up happening to what ended up happening to the skamoric all those years ago is that he got locked up in prison for a decade and um uh had half his tongue cut off if i didn't say that already i might have said that um but he, he had half his tongue cut off uh for insulting uh the aristocracy of the time the boyar and the the boyars and the boyarinas of uh russia and of uh, 15th century russia and so um uh from there uh, Kirill breaks up the fight, and Kirill, now that he's a monk again, his voice isn't as raspy as it was before. He's kind of healed himself uh, by becoming a monk again. Uh, and he breaks up the fight and takes Andre aside and uh, begs Andre to continue uh, with his art. He, he, he doesn't want Andre to waste his gift. And uh, it's here that he finally seems to redeem him. He, he seems to repent finally for like his bitterness and jealousy and stuff. He he, Kirill finally recognizes that he was, um, you know, that he was kind of he was a, a bit of a shitty person before because he was uh, spiteful and petty. He was like a Judas almost, you know, and um, and and that led to to so much more misery and suffering on his part because of his his sins, you know, because he wasn't willing to uh, just kind of accept who he was as a person and, and his level of, you know, uh, talent and, and so on and so forth. Uh, and he also now at this point, Kirill, he, he recognizes and has made peace with the fact that he will die an unknown. Whereas, uh, Andre still has a chance to, to make something really big of his life and, and pull himself out of the, the sadness and disc, you know, the sadness and melancholy that he's fallen into after the, the totter attacks and all that, you know, there's still hope and uh and redemption through art uh but uh andre still refuses to speak um from here eventually the uh, the bell is finished uh the dirt is chipped off the cast to reveal a beautiful uh silver or bronze bell beneath it uh the bell is raised with uh it's hoisted up with ropes and the prince and his men show up to see if it rings and uh boris is is terrified because um uh and he has someone else uh ring it for him um, the buildup to the, the ring is tense, but eventually the, uh, the, the clapper of the bell, uh, makes contact with, uh, 
the lip, the bell's lip, uh, the other, you know, the inside of the bell, the inside of one side of the bell, let's say, and um, it it uh, rings successfully. Uh, Boris uh, collapses in in relief, and uh, not long after, Andre finds him on the ground in the nearby farmland, uh, crying. And uh, Andre finally speaks, asking Boris why he is upset uh, because the bell was, after all, a success. Uh, and well, by the way, um, if if it hadn't rung, by the way, uh, the prince would have killed him. The prince, the, the prince, the grand prince of Russia would have cut uh, Boris's head off if the bell did not actually ring. So he's really relieved. Obviously, he's like super happy that it worked. But um, it's here that uh, Boris uh, r reveals. Uh, uh, that his uh, his dad actually never told him what the secret to bell making was. He never actually taught him like how how to do the process properly. Um, he was actually a, a shitty person, his dad, uh, and so Boris had to guess the entire time. So the entire time he was making the bell, he he was just he didn't know what he was doing. He was working off pure instinct, and uh, and yeah, he, he didn't know if, if he was doing things right or not. Uh, he could have very well died had the bell not rung. And so um, from there, Andre uh, sees. From that, Andre sees potential and uh, newfound hope in the boy and uh, takes him on to help him build and design the Trinity. And so uh, he, and he says, you know, uh, you'll cast bells and I'll uh, paint icons. And so I guess he's, he's found an apprentice and a he's found an apprentice and a, a uh, let's say, like a spiritual brother, you know, uh, or a spiritual son, maybe, uh, you know, he's found a, co a companion, you know, an artistic and creative comrade, let's say. Uh, a God, what's the word? A, mer a mutual spirit? I, I don't, I can't think right now. I don't know. But um, yeah, basically an artistic and creative brother. And so uh, a kindred spirit. There we go. A kindred spirit. Yeah. So Andre and Boris are kindred spirits. And from there, the movie uh, cuts to the epilogue. And um, the film ends with a, with an extended, uh, the epilogue is, it is an extended color sequence. So the rest of the movie was in black and white. Uh, but then now this this epilogue scene sequence is in color, and it shows us um, all of the real real life, uh, the real Andre Rublev's work, uh, all of his icons and stuff. And some of them are a little faded, but um, it's all still there today. You know, uh, about 536 years after his death, at the time the the film was released. So the time between 1966 when the movie was made and uh, 1430 when um, Andre Rublev was. Uh, said to have died or uh, get they, they that's when they guess he died um because they don't really know there, there weren't there weren't many records back in his time i don't think um so it's hard to tell but um yeah 536 years after he's died uh and then now well the the paintings are still there but it, it's even more because now it's uh it, it's about Sorry, hold on. 536 years after his death at the time the film was released and about 591 years after his death today in the year 2021. So it's been 591 years since he painted those, paint or since he died. And, uh, well, and since the days when those paintings were fresh and they're still there now, uh, almost 600 years later. So it's a pretty big deal. Um, and uh, the, the, the movie shows us all the, the different icons he did. Uh, and then the film and cuts to an image of horses in the rain, and from there the credits, and and that's it. Uh, is there anything you want to add to any of that, uh, Simone? Did I miss anything? I guess you cover everything from the start to the end, all the important things that they need to know about the film, uh, given all the it's a three hour long, and then you explain it well. Okay, so then I guess we can just um, dive right into the uh, the discussion then. So, uh, well, Simone, uh, what would you rate this film out of 10 and why? I'll rate it a, a 9 out of 10. Um, I'm still not sure about this film. I, I mean, I didn't get into much. I, it appears to me, but I... I haven't been into a deep introspection about this movie, all the aspects that I need to consider to make my final uh, final verdict regarding this one. Uh, nine out of ten, I guess it's my initial uh, my initial rating on, on the way how it um, appeals to me and the, the things that I'm looking for uh, when it comes to movies, um, given that this one is also from... Andre Trubor Truborski, I'm sorry if I 
I don't know, pronounce it uh, well. Uh, from the from the previous film that uh, we have reviewed, the nostalgia and and I can see this uh, how uh, his style in making the movies, all the introspection, all the the law. Why is it so? What he's trying to ask to what he what is the messages he's trying to convey with all those long. Um, Transitions, all those uh, that people may find uh, boring or something, but it is uh, it is what makes this film um, successful for me. Um, even though that there's not much on the um, the lines or, or or some conversation regarding uh, um, given to the characters, that it enables you, it gives you a room to think for yourself or the underlying topics that um, you need to think about. Uh, that's what I like it, and uh, I give it a 9 out of 10. So, so you, you gave it a 9 out of 10, right? Yes. 9 out of 10? Okay. Well, I, I will as well. I'm going to give it a 9 out of 10, too. Uh, because, yeah, I don't know if I like it better than... Um, I, I, don't, I don't know if I like it more or less than Nostalgia, or Nostalgia, or, or whatever the fuck. Um, but... Um, I think they're too different to compare that way, right? So, because so you know, by the way, uh, nostalgia is the only other Tarkovsky film we've both seen, so that's why I'm using that as my frame of reference when I think of Tarkovsky as a director and like you know c trying to compare it to just his work and also to compare it to other movies in general. But to start with, you know, comparing it to to other Tarkovsky films, I don't know if um I don't know if it's better or worse than uh, nostalgia. And again, I, I think it's like an apple or an oranges type situation where they're they're just too different, e even though they share. Uh, certain fundamental attributes in common they're just they're about different things they're about different aspects of the creative process or whatever they're 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 different forms of um you know expression personal expression on uh on behalf of the director you know so i, I just don't i don't know if it's even worth comparing them um but uh andre rublev the film uh, itself as a whole i i like it a lot i would say uh, but I reserve my, the thing about my rating system personally is that I reserve my 10 out of 10s, my perfect scores for shows and movies and books and media that, uh, you know, and other forms of media that, that hit me on all levels, right? So, uh, something like, like train spotting or Richard Linklater's, um, before trilogy or the, uh, the Sam Raimi Spider-Man, uh, trilogy or all seven of the Harry Potter films or, or, you know, the original Star Wars trilogy, or even the prequel trilogy, I would give those all 10 out of 10s because they affected me personally in, in a different, you know, in different ways in, in those, this, but in, in a complete way, I guess. Uh, you know, for me personally, Andre Rublev is more like um, Schindler's List or uh, Boyhood or uh, Mishima, A Life in Four Chapters. Uh, it, it's great, and it's a, it's a perfect film from an objective standpoint, but it's not quite life-changing, uh, at least not for me. Uh, and without uh, speaking for everyone, uh, I have a, a feeling personally that it's not meant to be that kind of film um, because it, it just isn't that kind of movie. You know what I mean? It, it's um, it's a little too unemotional for that. It's much more intellectual. It, it, it gets rid of the emotional to focus, to emphasize the, the intellectual, I would say. Like, yeah, there's... And really, the only emotion that it has is to kind of shock you a little bit. You know, it's kind of to make you feel a bit disturbed, I guess, at times. That's about as, as emotional as it gets, though, but it's more an intellectual kind of kind of movie. So it can't really... It's That's why, for me, it, it can't be a 10 out of 10. Uh, that doesn't mean that I don't enjoy it, but I would be lying if I said that it was one of my all-time favorites or anything like that, you know, so... Uh, and it doesn't have to be. Uh, and in fact, it's good that it isn't, because that just goes to show how um, diverse the the media of cinema, the media, the filmic medium, I guess, the cinematic medium, the uh, the medium of film itself can be. Right? You can have all sorts of different movies that do different things for you, and there's there's a range, and that's what I like about it. Because movies like this make you appreciate the 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 ones that you would uh, hold in the highest regard, that you would give those tens out of tens, uh, ten out of tens, even more. Right, so I would I would say it's a solid. This one, Andre Rublev, it's a solid nine out of ten for me. Uh, no hesitations. Uh, is there anything you'd like to add to that, Simone? Uh, uh, yes, um, especially in the date. Um, this one uh, was made in nineteen sixty six, and the nostalgia is made for uh, on nineteen eighty three. So we can see the date. So I guess that it's not a good thing to compare this to. Yeah, right. Because those are these were both made at different points in um, 
Tarkovsky's career and also the filming making techniques and everything, you know, the technology, if you want to get into that aspect of it as well, the technical aspect, let's say, which we'll talk about in a second here, but you know, uh, more, more broadly rather, but, um, it's, yeah, it's just, it's, it is apples and oranges. It really is. I mean, yeah. Uh, but, but it's also, it's important to note by the way, that this movie didn't need to be shot in black and white. Uh, in 1966, there was color. Um, there was color. And that's what you see at the end, right? They, they could have the whole thing could have been in color, but he chose not to do it in color. He chose to do it in black and white. And I think he said somewhere in, in an interview, I believe, when when I was doing the research for this, I think he, I remember him saying something like, uh, uh, that that he didn't he he wanted to do that because when we, um, I guess when we live or something, he said that we don't we don't ex we don't pay attention to color or something like our minds don't pay attention to color necessarily, and so he wanted to try to to make it reflect that uh if that makes sense but yeah that, that's that's what he had to say about it i'll try to pull up the exact uh quote in a second but um let me before that i do that i'll, I'll ask you right now uh simone what do you think of this film's technical aspects and, and the technical aspects that that includes everything from you know cinematography to editing uh the music the acting etc et you know what do you think of that particular aspect of this uh, this movie this film uh is it um for me the the black and white um uh, the black and white choosing the black and white for this thing yeah great vibe great job for portraying this um this film and uh, getting into um I guess uh, it shows me a different perspective regarding um a, a black and white cinematography because um when I think of that thing um uh, uh, it gets more to be uh, more on personal connection regarding the movie or something but this one is um talks more about um just like you say that this one is more on the intellectual focus more on the intellectual aspects rather than the personal connection that it could bring to the audience but yeah but that that one uh, that aspect really did a great job and and you're trying to connect it to to um to the everyday lives for example that uh i don't know it's just for me that um in everyday lives um uh, we uh, i agree with him that we didn't uh with we, we didn't notice that or we neglect the colors that we we see each day or, or something that it's just one color every chooses um, one or two colors to describe our day so uh, or something that we can relate to that thing but or the technical aspects when it comes to the cinematography again uh, the transitions that's what i i one aspect that i like about um andre trubisky also from the past movie that we reviewed uh nostalgia um the long transitions um it gave you time to think about what's happening but uh, it's just um for some people they find these movies um way too long but on the um artistic aspect that one is um uh, it's a great thing for me i like that uh that aspect that all the and when it comes to the characters of the um uh, character selection and the production management that they did um uh i'm okay with the characters um they did a great job for example the uh um the pool from the start or the harlequin, harlequin uh, it's just um it's just uh it's just it's it's um it's enough to get into the character or is it maybe it's more on the language um uh, that sets the character really be who what they need to be or something or to portray the character as well i guess the language helped them to portray their character or whatever the emotion that they need to bring to be honest, I don't understand what they're, uh, I get, um, it's some, I guess the, the subtitles are up at some points, but, um, you can get some, what they're saying to the language that they're using. Um, uh, it seems like they're always bickering or something, but when you get used to from the start or to the end of the, get into the film, um, you'll get what their, what the language is all about. Uh, the and the production um i read that um this one is um uh, a really expensive one it's supposed to be um a 1.6 million um 
Russian dollars uh, budget, but it's daring to cut to 1 million and the final one is uh, 1.3 million Russian dollars. I don't know how to convert it into peso or uh, US dollars, but it seems uh, really expensive from the production management and, and everything for the scenes and for example they use a lot of animals in this one the horses um and also um i guess they did a real thing where the for for all the construction sites that they're they're doing and also uh, especially the bell it it really looks expensive to this one to that one but um uh, but well, the, all the other technical aspects are good for me. The music, the costumes, um, the character selection. But uh, this is one thing that I just noticed um, from the sword fights, I guess. It, uh, uh, it's, it's more, it seems like more um, a kid's play than, rather than the, a serious um, sword fights. Um, I, I guess it, I can... Um, it's it's just okay for me. I understand that part, uh, knowing that um, it sets for my nineteen sixty six. Uh, from nineteen sixty six, uh, all the other aspects play that part that that wasn't so good or something. It's just um, it's just uh, it's just less than a minute or thirty seconds. I guess that it wasn't even thirty seconds from that part. Uh, from that part that I just noticed that the sword part, the source parts are not realistic, but yeah, but when you focus on the some parts of the raids, um, they did a uh, great job. For example, I don't know how to translate it, but the Bumawe or something. Yeah. Yeah, you know, um, <laughs> it's funny, but I I didn't think that the uh, the sword fights were necessarily like the the thing that like it, that didn't stick out to me. It's interesting that you said that though, because uh, what, what did stick out to me was um. When Foma gets uh, killed, when Foma gets uh, shot by the uh, the archer, the totter archer, I thought his death was a bit over dramatic. You know, like he spends like it just takes a little too long. He's kind of like jumping around and stuff. Kind of pulled me out. That was like the one thing that pulled me out of the movie was Foma, his acting uh, when he was uh, dying, uh, and the actor who plays that. Let's see his name, uh, Mikhail uh, Kononov. Kononov. Uh, by the way, Russian Russian dollars are rubles. So uh, yeah, the the budget was one point three million uh, rubles. And, um, but yeah, that, that it just, when he died, it was like wreathing around a bit too much and it, it was just kind of, it, it, it pulled me out of it. I, I think I have a theory about this though. I don't think that, uh, Tarkovsky's trying to be like a hundred percent realistic with that. I, I think he's more, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I think he's, because again, these aren't really emotional movies. They're intellectual ones. So I, I think, and a lot of what he does is very dreamlike, you know? So I, I don't know, maybe that's just excusing the fact that he made a mistake, um, but to me, I feel like he just, he kind of, that doesn't matter to him. He doesn't care. And so he might not like, uh, he might let those things slide a little bit. Um, cause that's not what he's trying to do mostly with his, his movies anyway. So, but you, you're right. Yeah. I mean, there, there are a few times throughout the film where that kind of is apparent that the sword wasn't necessarily, sword fighting wasn't necessarily the thing that pulled me out, but foam was overacting was. And that's the thing. I, I think he's, he's like, he, like, he's like Ingmar Bergman, you know, uh, they're, they're two very similar directors, um, and I think one of their one of the things that they have in common is that they both they're very theatrical, you know. And so a lot of the time, certain things can feel more like plays. More, you know, it's it's more like a play than it is a, a movie at times. And I think that's that's what the fighting would would have been like. I I, th I think that's my so yeah. It's like you said, it's more like a play than it is a uh, a movie with respect to the, to the choreography for that that sword fight. But yeah, um, I just want to read before we move on. By the way, I just want real quick. I wanted to read um, the exact quote from Wikipedia, and again, take we Wikipedia for a grain of salt or whatever. But you know, take everything that's on Wikipedia with a grain of salt, rather. But I'm just going to read this real quick. The the thing about color, the thing Andre had to say about color. So um, it says here that Tarkovsky chose to shoot the main film in black and white, and the epilogue showing some of Rublev's icons in color. Uh, in an interview, he motivated his choice with the claim that in everyday life, one does not consciously notice colors. Uh, consequently, Rublev's life is in black and white, whereas his art is in uh, color because, I guess, you know, you, you do have to consciously notice color when you're making art, right? Uh, it's kind of the point. But, I mean, not not that the, there aren't, like, colorblind artists or anything, but, you know, whatever, I don't know. Uh, but, but, yeah, the film was thus able to express the codependence of the of an artist's art and his personal life. So it was a stylistic choice, and he, he had a reason for it. But, um, 
There you go. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I usually think it's kind of pretentious when artists or when, you know, filmmakers or whatever, like, choose to make something black and white on purpose. You know, when I was first getting into, like, these kinds of movies, I used to think that was really annoying. But uh, I don't know. Over time, you kind of get used to it. You watch enough and you kind of just get used to it. So it's, it's whatever. It doesn't really make much of a difference to me. But, um, yeah, it's just a little interesting tidbit there for you, um, for, you know, for everybody listening. Uh, but, yeah, um, with regard to how I feel about the the film's technical aspects personally, I think, you know what, I, I think the cinematography is interesting as always, uh, just as interesting as it was in Nostalgia, if not a little more in uh, in this one, Andrei Rublev. Uh, I may go back eventually, actually, and uh, screen cap one of the long shots and uh, set it as the background on my laptop because I think they're really nice to look at. Um, they're very, they're, they're very bleak, they're very stark, but they're also very beautiful, you know, and that's kind of exactly what this movie is, and that's kind of what the moral of this movie is, if there is a moral, I don't know if it's a moral movie, but that, that's what the theme of the movie is, anyway, that's the movie's thesis, and, and we'll get into that in a little bit, but yeah, it's this sort of bittersweetness that I like, uh, there, there was more bittersweetness in, um, the bittersweetness here, it's more existential, it's more universal, it's broader, it's not as personal as it was in Nostalgia, because in Nostalgia, the bittersweetness is kind of the entire movie, really, that, that's, that's, that colors that entire movie, um, throughout from start to finish. This one, it has that, but it's more of an existential issue, I suppose, it's a broader, kind of universal thing, um, so yeah, but, um, Everything, uh, so everything Tarkovsky does to me, like, so far in the two Tarkovsky movies we've seen, you know, everything he does in the technical realm, uh, as far as, as a director as, and as a filmmaker, uh, it's deliberate. It's, it's de you know, yeah, yeah, it's deliberate. It's deliberate and appropriate for the story uh, the movie is trying to tell, right? Uh, because the film, Andrei Rublev, is, is essentially a depiction of an artist's inner life, you know? The, and the way that life is portrayed is going to have to uh, be a little demanding on the viewer as well. Uh, everything fits, uh, everything that happens, you know, every, everything technically, uh, it lends itself to the material, and uh, I enjoyed it. And to be honest, I could watch the movie again, even though it's a somewhat slow, somewhat uh, tough watch to get through. I, I honestly think it has a big rewatchability factor. Um, it, and it's it's the technical aspects that make Tarkovsky films so unique, in my opinion, uh, or at least part of what makes it so unique. Part of what makes them so unique. Uh, you know, this is the second film of his that we've seen so far, and uh, it was also very effective in in putting me personally into a deep sort of meditative state. Uh, someone said somewhere once that Tarkovsky uses the filmic medium, and I'm pretty sure I've said this before, but, uh, he, that, that Tarkovsky uses his movies as a way to pray, right? And so that, uh, so that watching his films is like partaking in, essentially, in an extended praying session, uh, prayer session, and I, I completely agree. And in fact, I actually, uh, while I was watching this, I lit a candle, uh, as I watched late at night to keep, uh, with the mood, uh, that a Tarkovsky film creates. Uh, it's great stuff. I, I love it, and uh, I feel like I've gained a lot more patience than I had before I watched both this and Nostalgia. You know, um, if you need to work on your patience, uh, building up your patience, Tarkovsky is a good person to uh, to go to. I would say, um, uh, as a director, you know, he he just does, he doesn't back down. He doesn't give in to his audience or or the needs of like I guess a mainstream audience. He doesn't try to catch as many people as he can. Um, you, as the individual viewer, you have to be willing to go out of your way and, and adjust in order to fully appreciate his works and, you know, and his, his movies. And that's something that I, I like. You know, I, I think that's kind of, as corny as it may sound, it's it's bold. You know, I, I would consider it to be bold. And so I have a lot of respect for him for that. Uh, is there anything you want to add to that, Simone? Uh, exactly. Uh, it wasn't, uh, he wasn't uh, doing this movie to appeal to some people. It's just, uh, you need to adjust or change your taste or stuff just to uh just to appreciate this uh this kind of films and knowing that uh set from a different era and then all the transitions is a bit uh a bit too long for something where you find it but it's worth um it's worth watching this movie uh it's just it's just it's something that makes this uh this movies um uh, worth watching and it's something that makes his movies, um, his movies or his work or is the identity that he uses or makes his uh, Andrei Tarbuski's um, work. Yeah, yeah, his his cinematography and his I guess well, especially his cinematography, but his technical um, filmmaking that that's what that's like his his stamp, you know, is his unique. 
personal stamp. It's like when you see a Tarkovsky film, you know immediately right away that it is a, a Tarkovsky film because it has that certain cinematography. It has that certain editing. It has that certain pacing. You know, so yeah, exactly. That, that's what I would say. It is. It's like his personal firebrand or his personal stamp. You know, that that's his voice to coming through. Um, now, let me ask you this though. This is just a little aside. You mentioned this already, but um, they so in, in order to film the horse death scene uh, that, that happens during the Tatar raid on uh, Vladimir, uh, Tarkovsky and his crew really did kill uh, the horse that fell from the stairs. The one that has that big fall. That was a real fall, and that was a real horse who died. They they actually shot him. They actually shot the horse in the head after uh, filming, and then took it to you know to do whatever you do with horses, turn it into glue or whatever the fuck you know, right? Um, but uh, yeah, and and before I ask this question, just keep in mind both you and the audience, just everybody listening, that um the horse came from a slaughterhouse, so they they brought the horse in from a slaughterhouse. It was going to die anyway, basically, and, and again, it was the body was sent back for commercial use afterwards. So uh, they, it wasn't like some weird, you know, thing they did. It was all kind of proper, right? It was all done as properly as something like that can be. Uh, but but that being said, you know, some people would find this objectionable, right? Killing, actually killing something in order to make a movie of a piece of fiction, something that isn't even real. You know, the horse didn't need to die the way that it did. It didn't need to suffer the way that it did. It, it, it died for a movie, for something that wasn't, you know, something fake, right? Essentially. Um, so let me ask you this, Simone. Uh, do you think killing a living creature for the sake of a fictional artistic work is uh, morally justifiable or not? And, uh, and why? Um, for me, it depends upon um, how will you use the animal or something. Um, this one, I guess that they did um, a rightful act, um, knowing that the horse is from a uh, for uh, is is really um, is really uh, cultivated or grown. Uh, it's really a livestock for um, uh, grown for um, for commercial purposes. Um, they, uh, I guess that. It depends upon how you will uh, will use things or will make it. Um, uh, people may find it that um, it wasn't morally objective, but it depends on how you will use it. Um, it's just uh, I remember something from um, from a, a local film festival before that. Um, um, after some alleged killing, they allegedly killed um, some dog to me uh, to made uh, a film, and then it made them. Um, uh, they disqualified for the film that they from the film festival that they wanted to get into. So I guess that it depends on how you will how you will make these things uh, morally acceptable, even though it it wasn't really is. Um, it depends upon the audience that you will want to appeal with. It depends on the um, moral values, the religious aspect that. Or the committee, or the people that, yeah, it depends upon the audience, or the people that will, or your critics will think of the things, or how you will defend yourself upon these things that you will do. Right, right, yeah, exactly. Um, me personally, I, I I'm gonna say yes. It, it was justifiable. Uh, I because it was gonna die anyway. You know, they they it came from a slaughterhouse and then they they turned it into uh, meat or you know glue or whatever the fuck they do with horses, right? They did that anyway, so it, it doesn't matter to me. I don't know. Um, but I, at the same time, you know what? I could understand someone not liking it e even then because it it is a bit morbid. Yeah, there, there there is something there. It, it is a bit kind of it is kind of fucked up. Like it's just you know. Um, but it also, to me, it just it also makes a lot of sense within the context of the times as well. And so I'm I'm more of a I, I try to be pragmatic about this kind of stuff. I try to be practical. I try to take into account every single aspect. You know, every single the, the situation from every single angle. Let's say right. So you know, I, I don't know. To me, it's like realistically, it's like do you think do you really think that people like filmmakers in the 1960s gave a shit about uh, animal safety the way that most filmmakers have to today? You know the the. Uh, uh, not to mention the fact that this was also made in Soviet era Russia. You know, it's pretty pretty fucked up Soviet Russia. You know, it's not not the it's not like it's not Disneyland. You know, it's not the happiest place on earth or anything. They don't have to. I don't know. They they, they got a lot else going on than um worrying about animals. It's just you got to be realistic about this kind of thing. You know, I I don't know. That, that's the way I see it personally. 
Um, I, I don't think the same safety codes were in place then and, and there, you know, the same um, animal safety, whatever, uh, guidelines, uh, and people just didn't have the same attitude towards it. And, and if you think about it, like, just let's, let's be honest here, you know, it's like a lot of the time there, there are places, I mean, like there are places in the Philippines, you know, it's like, I'm sure people in the Philippines, most people don't really think of animals the, the way that people in the, in the U S or UK, or let's say, I guess the Western, the West do, right. Or, you know, there, there are places that, you know, little tribes in Africa and stuff there are, you know, un, you know, there, there are rural peoples in, in, in the, the middle of the Himalayan mountains range, you know, who just don't give a shit about, you know, they, they snap animal necks like every single day. They don't give a fuck. You know, it's completely different. There are farmers in the U S who don't care, don't think about animals the same way that, um, you know, New Yorkers or LA types do, you know? So it's, it really depends on the person and it dep it's a cultural thing. I think it's a cult cultural thing. It's about, it has to do with cult. It's, it's an issue that, uh, really comes down to cultural subjectivity, I would say. And, and that's really, that's really it. I, I don't know. It doesn't bother me. And, um, and yet, you know, to the filmmakers, again, what they were trying to do by killing the horse was to create the, uh, you know, create a sort of shocking bit of imagery anyway, right? It was supposed to disturb the viewer. Uh, so they knew what they were doing, right? And to them, the ends uh, simply justified the means. And that was, they were okay with it. And um, and I, I think personally, in this particular scenario, it's, it's fine. I, I don't know. I, I don't care because the horse was going to be made into glue anyway. So you might as well get something out of it before that. And uh, it made for, uh, it, 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 that's just me. It doesn't bother me. And But, you know, what bothers me more than the fact that they killed the horse was that the image didn't really, like, it stayed with me, but it, it wasn't really memorable. I don't know. Like, it didn't really, like, uh, make me feel uncomfortable or anything. Like, it just, it was kind of nothing. You know, it wasn't a memorable scene for me. It didn't have that impact that it should have. So to me, personally, they kind of just, they killed the horse for nothing. Uh, for me as a viewer, I guess, because it didn't, I didn't care. Like, I, I just kind of looked at, I was too busy thinking about everything else that was going on in that scene. So that, that it didn't even have the effect that it should have probably, <laughs> but I don't know. Maybe I'm just weird like that, but I, it didn't, it didn't, I, I didn't really think of it too much. Uh, and so maybe it didn't really work artistically either. Uh, I don't, what, what do you think, Simone? Is there anything you'd like to add to that? I, I think that they've been noticed that scene. I guess it's just a not um, a random horse pull because knowing the, in the other parts that there are some other horse pull or something that uh, he focuses on the uh, horses. He's trying to to convey some message with the use of the horses, but uh, I guess he failed in in this part that uh, it's supposed to be the most controversial part, but. To me, it just doesn't. It's yeah. It's just okay. The horse fell, and then that's it. I, I guess that they fell to. There are a lot of things that happening when they did that part. So I guess that those part um um uh, covered the what's happened to the horse. So it just it just doesn't matter as much as the other things that taking place during that time. Yeah, honestly, I think that was a bit of a technical um, error or shortcoming on their part. Uh, or maybe it's just us just being weird or, and disaffected or whatever, but, um, or maybe being of a different generation, you know, it's just, we've seen worse, I guess, maybe things kind of, the, the ante's always been upped with time, you know, always getting upped, you know, with time, the envelope's always being pushed just a little further with the years, but it's like, yeah, I, I don't know, man, uh, the scene was way too busy. It's like, there was so much else going on. It's like, I didn't even, I barely even noticed that they, they did it. So they kind of, again, for me personally, it's like, I don't care that they killed the horse, but it's like, they kind of killed it for nothing. You know, it wasn't even like a scene that like blew my mind or anything. It's like, if they're going to do it, do it for some, isolate it, you know, stand it by itself, you know, I, I, I don't know. Anyway, that, that, that was me. But, um, I, I pulled up while you were talking, I pulled up, um, the conversion rates. And so keep in mind also inflation and all that, you know, this was, this is 1966, uh, money we're talking about for the budget. But, um, so, so it was like 1.3 million rubles, right? So, uh, 1.3 million rubles in us dollars. So one Russian ruble equals, uh, point, Four point zero point zero fourteen uh, U.S. dollars. So, one point three million rubles is only um, seventeen thousand five hundred seventy one uh, dollars and fifty one cents in, in U.S. money. And then in uh, in in Rush in Filipino pesos, uh, one Russian ruble equals point uh, sixty six Filipino uh, peso. And so, one point three million Russian rubles is uh, that comes out to um, well, there's no commas. So give me a second here. Let me try to put the comma in. Um, 
Sorry, give me a second. Uh, it's 852,253.31 uh, uh, Filipino pesos or peso. Is that a lot, uh, Simone? Um, it's a lot for uh, for for me, but um, um, for the budget for a film, um, it's uh, it's too it's too short. I guess you can't even meet a uh, a good movie like this one with this with that budget. Yeah, you know what? Maybe before we end the video, I'll do like a quick um inflation calculator thing because it is nineteen sixty six money, so you know it's probably a lot more than that today. But um. Yeah, I just thought that was a little interesting. So uh, next question, let's see here. Uh, so we've talked about the, the, okay, so we've talked about, you know, we've talked about the technical aspects, we talked about the horse, uh, but now what do you think of the movies, what do, what do you think of the film's uh, narrative aspects, uh, Simone? So that, that would include like the plot, uh, the characters, the pacing, the story structure. This, this seems to have a unique kind of narrative, um, well, narrative structure, narrative, you know, uh, uh, aspect to it. So uh, talk to me a little bit about that. How do you feel about that? Um, what I noticed and this really have talked about earlier that uh, the uh, the cinematography, all those um, the long transitions, uh, it's one it's a one fact is the one technique that he uses to convey the story, but uh, the story's development for some it may find it uh, Really slow. Um, it covers uh, uh, a two two decade of his life, but uh, in a in a in a three hour long movie. But so he can convey it um, into a one or compress it into one uh, a one one hour long movie. But um, I guess that it might lose its it's the the style or the uniqueness that it has if they, he will compress it to this one because um the narrative of this one doesn't only depends on the uh the conversation or the lines of the characters that are taking place there's not much um for a 3 hour long movie uh, there's not much um conversation or get into the lines of the characters that you will see or for some for some people the uh, when it comes to movie, they tend to more to look more on the conventional aspects, all those conversation or the code or the um, lines or something. But uh, the narrative, uh, the, for me, uh, it appears to me that the narrative of this uh, th this movie it depends on purely on um, on the on the cinematography or those long transitions. Um, we can see uh, or it gives it gives you a room to think about uh, what's happening or something, what's happening or in relation to the character, all those and what's happening on his environment, all those. Uh, it wasn't focused more on the uh, on Andre, the the main character. It focuses more on the people around him or what are those things that could affect him or something, or. As the characters around him develops, um, we can see uh, how those things affects him uh, directly and indirectly. Those things, for uh, example, uh, you know what I mean. Directly, indirectly, and you come to me that uh, it give it gives time for him to think about for himself. It's, it wasn't. It doesn't happen. Um, uh, it is uh, the thing. Uh, it sets up from the start to begin. It compiles, uh, and then he. There are a lot of developments from the span of the years, and he, first he, he questions his. He made his questions about his faith or whatever his belief is, and he he has been confused about um, what's really uh what his religion is for, what our belief is for. Um, he. he is he really doing the right thing that he needs to do, or he's just who, or he's just end up all the the people that crucify uh, Jesus? But yeah, more of the what I like about it is that it wasn't um, directly. It gives you all those long transitions, give you time to think about what is going to happen, or or give you a shoe or something that. 
not really um, emotionally. There's not much emotional aspect to this one, but more on all the context that is happening is more on, um, just like you say, it's more on intellectual or philosophical aspect of things. You can say that it's just uh, the way it is. Uh, yeah, um, to sum it up, it's just, yeah, the, the long, uh, the, the special thing about this one is the long, the long transition is all about the, the it made, um, it makes the, the style or the story that you want to convey effective because, uh, it's all about thinking, uh, leaving the room for your audiences to think about what's happening. It's not just, it's just, it's not, um, spoon feeding or something. Right, yeah, no spoon feeding, no, no spoon feeding at all, you know, and um, yeah. So, uh, what do I think? Uh, I, I like, I guess, well, to start, I, I like personally that I that the movie is broken up into eight distinct parts, uh, six main chapters, and the prologue and the epilogue. Uh, it, it covers a lot of ground while also leaving a lot unanswered. Uh, you know, because we see Rublev's life, we get a little window into his life, but we don't really know everything about him. It's not a comprehensive. Uh, film because it's it's not necessarily a biography and we'll get into that later but yeah um, uh, for me though personally the, the pacing is good uh, the, the pacing is, is really good I, I think the pacing is good the pacing is good because it, it, it gives you enough time as a viewer to um, to contemplate at least some of what goes on while you're still actually watching the film uh, you'll still need some time to reflect after it's over uh, yes but uh, it, it's good to have those long drawn out periods of blank space and blank time without any action or without anything you know kind of driving the narrative forward just just kind of times to stop and reflect you know little intermissions within the film itself right that that they are, that, that are incorporated into the film itself and are part of it it's not like you know it's not like a little interlude where you know it's not like a real intermission where it's it, it stop like the movie stops altogether and you get up to go to the bathroom and you come back no it is it is part of the movie the, the movie is built in has built in uh, intermissions to begin with and those intermissions are again they I keep saying this but they're part of the movie itself and they and they add another kind of layer of meaning to it I think personally they kind of flesh it out a little more um and and yeah it, it, they give you an opportunity to let the film's tone uh, sink in and and interact with you on a deep intellectual level uh, and, and by doing this it's almost as if Tarkovsky makes his films feel as though they're good for your soul uh, if that makes sense, you know, kind of like, again, like what that, whoever said that on the internet or whatever earlier, it's like, um, you know, that, that, that Tarkovsky makes movies like, um, as a way to pray, you know, the, the, his movies are like long prayers, you know, uh, they, it's as if they rejuvenate and revitalize something fundamental uh, within you and, and breathe new life into your spiritual existence. Uh, they they add uh, new wood to the fire that is your capacity for creativity or faith or introspection or whatever it may be, uh, as they say, I suppose. Um, and you know, to be honest, I, I felt cleansed coming out the other end of Andrei Rublev, uh, like, a, like going through a car wash for the soul, let's say. Um, I also like the fact, uh, and I also like the fact that the uh, supporting cast, by the way, uh, got more time, more screen time than uh, Andrei Rublev, the the protagonist, uh, similar to Nostalgia, um, like how the the crazy old man in Nostalgia and and the secretary or the translator got more attention than Andrei the poet. Um, here, uh, Andrei Rublev doesn't get as much attention as uh, some of the other characters, like Foma, uh, Daniil, uh, Kirill. Especially Kirill, but um, Boris as well too. Like you know, that whole chapter is just it just cuts to a completely different character who isn't Rublev. We don't even see Andre Rublev until like uh, halfway through that that chapter, right? Um, but yeah, yeah. Uh, that being said, though, uh, when all is said and done, everything ultimately does come back to Andre in the end, uh, and he is still ultimately the film's main subject. And uh, and yet uh, at the same time, the film defines him largely through the actions and behaviors of other characters, right? Other experiences that fall outside of uh, Andre's immediate relation. Uh, he, is the protagonist as he is the protagonist as observer, uh, more so than anything else, kind of like uh, Nick Carraway in The Great Gatsby. Although that's somewhat different because in The Great Gatsby, uh, Gatsby himself is st still the main subject uh, and, and not even though he's not the char main character, whereas uh, Nick Carraway is secondary. So... In this case, Andre Rublev is the main character, is still the main character, even though he's um, 
even though he's, you know, not always at the front of the action, let's say, but he, it always comes back to him. It's it's like he's, I guess it's like he's like, I would say he's 70% Nick Carraway and um, 30% Gatsby, but ultimately still the main character, if that makes sense, I guess. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I guess the point I'm trying to make by saying this is that uh, I, I like variations on conventional storytelling tools. You know, it's not, it, it, this does, it doesn't always have to be a Luke Skywalker or a Batman or a Spider-Man, you know, or, a, or an Odysseus. You know, it, it can be, uh, it, it can be, you know, it can be whatever, really. There's a whole range of op options that you can have mixing and matching with that, kind of playing around with that conventional uh, protagonist role, right, hero role. Um, and I, I think, personally, I think this uh, particular variation works perfectly for this movie and uh, what it tries to accomplish and uh, does so with uh, great success. Is there anything you'd like to add to that, Simone? Yeah. I didn't already... I already talked about this since the idea. Oh, okay, yeah, sure. Uh, so, um, well, now let me ask you this then. Uh, did you have a favorite chapter or section out of the the eight that there are? Is there any that stuck out to you in particular as like you know your your personal favorite or anything like that? I'm still thinking. What's my favorite? But I guess it. It's not actually the my favorite. Uh, I can think of of my favorite uh, um section because there are a lot of things that are happening in each section that um that makes it um uh, stand it stand on its own. Like just like in the Mishima Mishima story that um we have review um before. It's just a, the, the best thing that appeals to me is that um. We try to when they try to reenact the crucifixion of uh, crucifixion of Christ, and then um, and then they they focus on the eye of the child looking on what's happening, and then how in innocency is um, smiling. Just it it speaks a lot for me. Um, oh, when it comes to these things, so especially it could be it can we can take these things as innocence about religion or innocence about politics and everything it's just everything there are a lot of things that we can get into and especially um the senior project we of that part that it was said on the blanket of snow in the in something uh in the top of a mountain it's just i really like that part Yeah, I, I like the passion too. So your your favorite part would probably be your favorite chapter if you ha if you had to pick one, um, just for the fun argument's sake or whatever. Um, it would be the passion fourteen oh six, correct? Uh, yeah, I think so. That that is that part. Okay, cool. And um, yeah, you know, for me too, it's it's uh it's hard for me to answer this question because uh, the amalgamation of um all eight chapters really is greater than the sum of its parts. It's one of those things, you know, just like with Mishima, like you said. Uh, but personally, I, I would say if I had to single anything out, I I I I, I would say I enjoyed the pro prologue a lot actually, uh, because it the, the prologue prologue it works on more than one level, you know. Uh, it, it could be a standalone because on the one hand, it could be a standalone short film all by itself, as it doesn't have much connection to the rest of the, the film from a narrative standpoint, you know, because none of the characters that are in it ever appear in the rest of the, the film or anything. It, it has nothing to do with Rublev at all, really, uh, on that uh, uh, front, right? But but at the same time, on the other hand, it, it also functions as a sort of fundamental summary of everything that the movie is about, right, thematically. Um, it is a beautifully, uh, poetically struck, constructed uh, meditation on the creative process. Uh, the struggle to start, you know, with the, the people... The, the people kind of uh, attacking one of the, the guys who's helping the, the man who's about to fly on the hot air balloon um, take off, right? That that guy gets attacked by some random villagers who don't know what's going on and don't like it. Uh, and so that, that would represent, of course, the struggle to start when it comes to, you know, writing a book or uh, writing a screenplay or, uh, you know, painting something. Uh, and then from there, taking off and flying and being up high in the sky, that, that is the euphoria of success, right? And then the, the fact that the flight is so short, that is the ephemerality of that euphoric success. And, and then the, the, the flight ending and, and the person crashing just into mud and, and that's it, it's over, you know, and presumably dying. Um, 
or at least that's what I believe the film implies is that the guy dies after he hits the ground like that. Um, that is that that of course uh, corresponds to the the sardonic uh, morbid humor and irony that is associated with failure, with creative artistic failure. You know, it it's great stuff. It's it, it is great stuff, and it's all in like the first ten to five to ten minutes of the or so of the movie if even that i'm pretty sure it's like five minutes right so it's it's great i, I just i really like it. it it's it was a standout thing for me um is there anything you'd like to add to that simone yeah i i agree with you that uh the prologue is also a good one i thought it's just a, a different story from from the whole movie i guess it yeah, this is said that um, it could stand on its own. To be honest, I, I get I'm 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 quite confused on what's happening to when it comes to the prologue and to the connection to the first real chapter of the the story. But um, reading into the Wikipedia articles, I get into that it was a, a different one. So yeah, I guess that I, I get, um they really did a good job uh, um in incorporating that uh the chapter or the prologue um, in this one because uh there is something that we can relate to what's happened in the movie but yeah it could it could stand on its own that's why it it makes it more good or something right yeah it's good that it's it's able to uh stand on its own two legs and uh that that's what i liked about it personally but um now let me ask you this on the other hand we've talked about the Favorite, your favorite chapter or section. Uh, did you have a least favorite chapter or section? Uh, I don't know. Um, it is uh, in relation to the uh, to the n nostalgia n nostalgia movie that uh, we reviewed the last time. That uh, when the when you said that there's always a a one a woman that will seduce uh, the main character to get into. Is uh to her desire or to agree with his desires or something that um uh, is trying to destroy the character, but um that that part when uh I don't know if she's a witch or some leader of some or some tribe um uh, tried to uh to seduce um uh, Andre or to corrupt his um his religious uh being a monk or. It's just some people will find it up, and I kind of find it up. But given the context that it was, uh, it was on the religi religious 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 basis, uh, I understand why they put their scenes. Uh, the scenes there are some scenes that um, that we can say that are also not so, that that good. For example, um, the the part where the. Uh, it's quite brutal for me the the raid some there are some parts of uh, uh the one that they shouldn't uh, uh they it could be more gory than in that it that it than it appeals to the movie i, I guess that it could be better if, if it's for me it's just it will be appeal to me it much way gory or something they try to avoid to see show some parts but it's fine but yeah i'm looking forward to make it a bit more gory not something that will turn your stomach upside down but um it's just for me that it will enable me to get into what's what's really happening okay so you didn't think that this, the scenes that were supposed to be disturbing were as disturbing as they could have been because of you know maybe the technological technical limitations or whatever of the filmmaking that they did for them uh i i don't know um but yeah, yeah, it's interesting that you did connect um the whole kind of motif of uh the seductive woman, you know, from uh nostalgia to the seductive woman in here here in uh uh Andre Rublev, but I I would kind of disagree with you a little bit. I mean, you did say that it, it is there's more of a point to this one, but I think the reason why the one in nostalgia bothered me so much was that it didn't really feel like it lended its it didn't it didn't feel like it added to the movie in any way. Whereas this one it, it adds a lot to the movie it's actually one of my favorite scenes if i'm being honest because um it's really important you know and it's it's it it, it is a it is a metaphorical you know it's like well it's not metaphorical because it happens but i mean i get well it's like the perfect representation of um sort of 
challenging faith. It's like faith being challenged by reality, I suppose, or different aspects of reality. It's like, you know, his worldview, his entire worldview is being put into question. It is being called into question by this, this woman, you know, who is, he does not approve of, he doesn't approve of what she's doing, but what she's doing, you know, it, it just because it doesn't, he doesn't like it, you know, it doesn't mean that it doesn't work for her or whatever. It doesn't mean that she doesn't, you know, get a lot of joy and, and happiness out of it. Right. Doesn't mean that it's wrong. Just be, just because he thinks it's wrong doesn't mean that, that it's necessarily wrong uh, objectively, you know. And that's really what that scene um, captures, you know. That that's that what that whole interaction encapsulates. Um, the other one with Andre the poet in uh, nostalgia and his his interpreter. The reason why I didn't like that one was just it's like that 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 because I don't know that one, that one was weird. It was like he's a her boss, you know, and like you don't talk that way to your boss you don't you don't have this weird kind of european bullshit like free love kind of thing going on on a because that, that's a professional relationship it just doesn't make sense on on that level and, and also it just it didn't again it didn't really add anything to the movie i it, what, what did he really what what did she really um call into question or challenge by um trying to fuck him you know in the hotel or whatever nothing it was is it, bullshit it's just a waste of time it was just it was fucking it, it felt very um you know, I don't know. It felt like some weird masturbatory fantasy on uh, on Tarkovsky's part. Just ah, God, it was annoying. I don't know. Very uh, very self indulgent. But um, here, you know, it, again, it, it it does lend itself to it because again, the movie is about one of the major themes in the film is uh, hypocrisy. You know, hypocrisy and I guess the downfalls of uh, the downfall of ideology. You know, ideology of any sort, but in, especially in this case, uh, religious ideology. I guess you know because it's like. Uh, what ends up happening is that by trying to be a good person, you end up becoming the bad guy. You know, you end up becoming the, you, trying to be like, you know, in trying to be like Jesus, you end up being, uh, one of the people who crucified Jesus, you know, and crucifixion itself is like kind of the ultimate form of persecution. Right. And so I, I, I kind of, I thought it was interesting how the, the three men kind of, they crucify Rublev, but in a weird sort of mocking way and in a different kind of way, you know, they're making fun of Jesus by doing it, but it's it's funny how they they do that you know it go well, it works on a number of levels but the the first level being that it goes to show that they don't have any respect for religion uh the, the other level that it works on the second one is that it, it shows that religion doesn't help them you know that it does a lot of bad for them in in that respect it's it's the bad guy in that case you know uh it, it's actually it's the villain for them that that is their perspective to them it is the villain because they can't they're, they aren't it doesn't allow them to run around naked and have sex and do it, whatever the fuck they want to do you know what they get up to in their own time their own time should be their own business but uh instead there's this authoritarianism there are these authoritarians coming in and telling them that they can't because it's not necessarily a religious is issue per se it, it's not a it's not a religious specific issue religion specific issue it's an issue of uh of universal uh, uh you know forms of authoritarianism right it's uh, this a pro-authoritarian versus anti-authoritarian argument, right? That that's the real issue at hand. Um, it's not necessarily political or religious, but politics and religion tend to be the uh, the realms, I guess, or the fields in which this stuff um, fosters, right? And this this stuff kind of grows the most. Uh, but yeah, you know, it, it's because though again, because those are both uh, systems of organized belief, and when you have a system of organized belief, you uh, run the risk of having uh, authoritarianism grow, right? Like just like Nazism, just like uh, you know certain forms of socialism and communism. You know, I mean, Soviet Russia. You know, look at and that that I feel like that connects to that too. By the way, because Tarkovsky made this in Soviet Russia, and I think he was trying to say something about uh, creative freedom with that. You know, artistic freedom. I think to me, to a certain extent, I think the the scum the scamoric represents uh, you know an artist in Soviet Russia trying to say what they want to say, but not being allowed to, being shut down by the thought police. You know, and the thought police were in that case the the soldiers, whoever they are. Maybe they're they're Christian soldiers. Maybe they're representatives of the Orthodox Church. Who knows? But um. Yeah, you know, that those are the thought police. They they control what he's saying. They censor him, you know, and they punish him for trying to be himself, right? For uh self for his self-expression. Well, and and so that that was that scene for me. You know, that that kind of boils down that whole aspect of the what the movie's trying to say about uh creative freedom, artistic freedom. Uh and and it shows and I, I like it because it, it it adds a lot of nuance to Andre's character. Because Andre, a character like Andre, an observer protagonist like that, they kind of run the risk of not really having a personality. 
But um, that that was one of the scenes that kind of gave him a personality, you know, because it called into question everything that he believes in and everything that he kind of is as a devout monk, you know, as a devout Christian, as a as an icon painter, you know, this great icon painter. It put everything into question for him, and it had uh, consequences that were reflected in the rest of the movie, right? Because in the next chapter after that, you know, he doesn't want to he doesn't want to paint the what the Grand Prince tells him to paint because he doesn't want to scare people into submission. You know, he doesn't want to get them. He doesn't want to to convert them by scaring them. He wants to inspire them. He wants it to be a positive thing, not a negative thing. And maybe he wouldn't have felt that way if he hadn't had that conversation with that woman, you know? So I don't know that that's just, I, I thought it was uh, very important. Whereas the one nostalgia is just fucking stupid. I, it, it's self-indulgent because again, it has very little to do with the themes of bitter sweetness in that. And, and, um, I guess, uh, uh, cultural alienation. It didn't really have anything to do with it at all. It didn't um, make Andre question himself as a poet. All he does is smack her in the ass at, at the end of the day, you know, when, when they're when they're done having their conversation. It's it's stupid. It's a stupid fucking scene. I don't know. Whereas this one, I think was it was very it was one of the most important scenes in this film actually. So it's interesting. It's interesting that um, that uh, that dichotomy, I guess, that difference. Um, but yeah, is there anything you'd like to add to that, Simone? Yeah. Uh... Yeah, I agree with you. I said that uh, that it could be uh, it couldn't uh, that it would not appeal to some somebody. I am still still don't know what's uh get into some parts of the movie that uh, needs more inspection or something. There are a lot of things that to contribute. I guess that every part of the movie is important. Uh, there are a lot of things that we can say that uh, affected um the main character Andre and. And this, especially this part, um, I didn't, uh, I didn't um, consider it before that it, it really one of, I guess this is the first, uh, this is Mark, the start of the thing, uh, that, that he questions himself or he questions his belief and everything. He made to, he comes into, seems more thinking more about himself or what's gonna be his impact as, uh, as a religious more. Or what he as his profession as the painter. Yeah, and so that's that's why it was important to me anyway. Um, but yeah, so that and that's why I think it's important within the context of the overall film framework. And yeah, like I said, I I, didn't, I wasn't trying to say that you know you didn't uh, say that or, or whatever. But I, I was just I was using I, I was using your point to uh, kind of make a point to the audience, I suppose. So uh, yeah. Um, but for me personally, my, my least favorite chapter or section, I, I would probably have to say it was, um, if I had to pick one, if I had to pick one, it would be the epilogue. Uh, and, and it's not that I hated it or anything, but it just didn't seem to have the effect on me that the movie was seemingly intending for it to, if that makes sense. Um, I, I kind of got bored looking at all of, uh, the real life, the real Andre's work. And I don't think that it's necessarily that it was Andre's work that bored me or anything, because I, after I watched the movie, I, I went and I looked up, uh, some of uh, Andre's icons and I think they're very pretty and I, I think I might actually set one as like my phone wallpaper sometime or something because I think they look nice they're, they're really cool looking uh but personally actually I uh, if I'm being honest I actually prefer uh Theophanes the Greeks the real Theophanes the Greeks uh, painting style to uh, artistic style to Andres but that's just that's just me I think it's I think Theophanes is really uh, fucking good but um yeah yeah I just uh I might set that as one of my phone backdrops or something sometime but um you know, but within the context of the movie, like the, the, the epilogue, the way that they show off his work, just that montage, I don't know what it is about it, but I, it kind of goes on a little too long and there's not really enough to it, I guess. Uh, and maybe, maybe for me, maybe it was the bias of expectations that did it, uh, that did that for me, that made it kind of bored, boring, or sorry, that made me kind of bored and made the sequence kind of boring, uh, to me, uh, Maybe it was my bias. Maybe it was my expectations. My my my, my expectations might have made me a little biased uh, thinking about it because um, because I I came into the film expecting it to be about how Andre got the inspiration to draw specific things in his work. You know, uh, I I thought um, we would see more like more of the origins or the sources of inspiration, like direct inspiration. And and the only direct source of inspiration we are shown is with the uh, disabled woman who was actually played by Tarkovsky's uh, first wife. Uh, fun fact. Maybe not first wife, but one of his wives. Um, but yeah, she she insp that that woman ends up inspiring uh, Andre Rublev to paint a feast, according to Wikipedia. Anyway, I don't know where in the film it, it shows that, but yeah, um, I, I thought there would be more direct significance to the images themselves and the events of of uh, Andre's life as um, 
depicted in the film, but yeah, I don't know. Uh, I, I thought the epilogue was going to connect the events of the film to the real life Andre Rublev's uh, work in a more direct way. Uh, but it's it's fine that it didn't. Uh, I think now that I've done the research and spent a little more time thinking about it, I, I can view the epilogue as it was intended to be viewed. And, and that's great. You know, I, I think it's interesting stuff. Uh, is there anything you'd like to add to that, Simone? Uh, uh, the movie is more focused on on uh, our character development of, of, uh, of Andre as an individual or how the things that... Uh, affected him as a painter but yeah and they could portray it in a way that um how these things affected him as a painter or incorporate um uh, all these things um into his paintings or whatever things happen they will show him as doing his paintings but i don't know it, it just the movie is good as the way that it was and and also the that part for example that you said the epilogue i I see it um, more than just, uh, I don't consider it as, as a part of the movie. I guess that when you, uh, as the ending part of the movie, I guess it's just more on the credits or something for me that, uh, for example, in the, for example, or some movies or a uh, documentary movie or something that they will show some background history of the character. Or who is really the character, or where where is the character, where is the story is based on? So that's how it seems to me the the epilogue. Well, so now let me ask you this: um, what, what? So, well, now what did the, what did the film? What did the film Andre Rublev uh, teach you about the real life uh, Andre Rublev? What did the film teach you about the real Andre Rublev? Um, when it comes to um to artists or some known paint um painter or some, for example, anyone known in the in the history, uh, people uh, tend to think more or look into more their works rather than their character itself or who they really are as an individual, not just um not just um what they're known for or some heroes or something. It's just um, people tend to look more, for example, I am a hero or something that people will tend more on what I did or so. It's more focused on to be a hero or to be known as an individual. They, p- people focus more on what you really did or what's the important or significant uh, thing that you did for the community or makes you known or something. But yeah, we tend to neglect or who the character really is or what, uh, why, how did he come up with these ideas? That's just what I like into this one that uh, I get into, I didn't know him before or even now I still don't know him. I don't know much about him, about the, the his, his significant role as, uh, in, in Russia or, I mean, the important one or something. But yeah, I tend to know more about his character developments or the, uh, the movie set me in his foot or what's, what's really, it's not just intended for me to to feel what he's feeling or think what he's thinking. It's just, uh, it also gives you a chance that, to think about the context that are happening. For example, uh, about religion when you're, well, I think that's, that's a reality when, when you're trying to be kind or do something good or to you 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 forgot all the all the fundamental things that you need to consider to be good as an individual or you need you try to be to make things to be good or to appeal that you become an something that an authoritarian to 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 tell people that you should do it and do that and do that or whatever they you want to tell them people to do or the beliefs that you want to implement them right away. I think it's not just that. There are a lot of things that you should consider or the basic element, the fundamental things before you move on to such thing because um, if, you, you're, if you're not paying attention, you will become the person that you devise or the, the reciprocal or the exact opposite of the thing that you want to pursue. 
Right. Yeah. Right. Um, well, you know, for me personally, okay, I, I didn't feel like I learned anything. <laughs> I learned pretty much nothing about, uh, the real Andre Rublev, uh, if I'm being honest. Uh, and without verification, I, I have no idea if what happens in the movie is, is actually factually accurate or not. Uh, but to be honest, I, I, I just, I kind of doubt it. I doubt it. I, I doubt that pretty much anything in like the, other than the very basic background details, like it, the fact that he is, that the film is set in Russia at, at the time that it's set in, you know, the time and place and all that, and, and some of the locations and whatnot, um, besides that, I, I don't think any of it has anything to do with the real Andre Rublev. I, and I don't think Andre, uh, Tarkovsky, the director really gave a shit, you know, it, well, because I, I think what uh, a part of it is that there seems to be very little information available about the real life Andre Rublev in the first place, you know, so it, it doesn't really matter whether the film captures the essence of, of who the man was as both a person and an artist. Uh, all, all that matters is that the story is, is good right? And, and that the setting is both visceral and believable. Um, and, and that the film engages the viewers on a deep intellectual level and kind of takes them on a journey. You know, um, on Andrei Rublev himself, the man himself, he was a good choice for his subject uh, because he lived during an interesting time in Russian history, uh, you know, when the Tatars were stirring shit up in that particular part of the world. Uh, his icon paintings were conceived during uh, against the backdrop of a very chaotic, you know, very tumultuous era. Uh, and plus, I, I think that, uh, Tarkovsky's, he was interested in, in war as a, as an artistic slash creative subject. Um, and in fact, from this movie, I, I think I learned more about the Tarkovsky, you know, the Tarkovsky Andre, uh, than the Rublev Andre, if I'm being honest. Uh, Tarkovsky's other film, uh, Ivan's Childhood, for example, that, that one's about, uh, World War II in Nazis, uh, and so replace World War II with uh, 15th century Russian conflicts and uh, replace Nazis with Tatars, and you basically get Andrzej Rublev. Uh, I don't know anything about Tarkovsky's personal history because I'm saving uh, learning about that until after uh, we've seen more of his films here on this podcast, right? But uh, I have a feeling I, I have a feeling that he, he may have been a child of war. It would explain uh, war's significance in his work, uh, or at least in this film and uh, Ivan's childhood, which I haven't seen, but definitely want to eventually. But uh, yeah, and I'm pretty sure in interviews he said that um, he chose Andre Rublev because he wanted to have a an artist who was sort of central, sort of pivotal to uh, Russian culture and Russian history. That's really it. That's that's what it comes down to. It's that that's why he chose him. He didn't. He wasn't interested in his life necessarily. He was just interested in his place in history. Um, and that's not a bad thing. Like that's not a good or bad thing, really. It's just it's the way it is. It's what he decided to go with. That's why he picked it. But yeah, it's not about. It's not necessarily about uh, Andre Rublev, the man, because it. And again, I, I think a lot of what it comes down to is that during that period, there weren't a lot of uh, written records or anything. So it's like you can barely. There, there, there's no real story to tell there anyway, because you don't. We don't know shit. You know, we don't know what the fuck happened to him as a person anyway. So it doesn't matter. There was very little information about him to begin with. So it's like, why not just make it all up? It doesn't. There does again. I, it doesn't really matter. In fact. This movie is like, you know, I, I wonder what Andrzej Rublev would have thought about the movie. I wonder if he would have looked at it and been like, God, what the fuck is this shit? This is nothing to do with what, what I actually did. Um, you know, but, <laughs> but, but I don't know. You know, I don't know. That that has nothing really to do with any any of it. But um, yeah. Uh, is there anything you'd like to add to that, Simone? Yeah. Uh, they say that uh, there, there wasn't much um, written. Uh, written uh, documents about uh, about him so nobody really no one really knows um, who who uh, who Andre Turble, uh really is or any this that's why I noticed that there there's not much um, um, critics regarding the story about the historical the sig historical uh, significance of this film or uh, more of uh, more of the uh, the critics or the uh, the things that uh, wanted this film to to be not shown or something that it's mu it's my it's much more on the US uh, Soviet Union issue rather than the historical views of the movie. 
Oh, okay. Interesting. I didn't know that. So they, they focus more on, you know, the not, not the, you know, the, not the history and not the, I guess the period that, cause it is a period piece to, you know, it's more a period piece than it is a, a biopic or a biographical, um, picture. I, I don't know why I had a hard time saying that. Uh, but yeah. Um, Hmm. What else was I going to say? Oh, you know, yeah, yeah. What I was going to say is that it, it does, it's not necessarily like a bad, like I said before, it's not necessarily a bad thing that Tarkovsky, um, didn't like, you know, make it a hundred percent factual because again, there aren't really many facts in, in this case. Uh, and I think, you know, I, I still think the movie is, it's one of, it's probably one of the best honors you can do an artist. You know what I mean? It's probably like one of the, the nicest things you can do for an artist, like one of the, the biggest, like, uh, I guess, accolades that you can give an artist you know because you, he's really he's honoring his work he's honoring the man as an artist you know because he's constrict I, I think that's a big deal it's like he has taken that person's life and he has made that person he's made andre rublev uh andre tarkovsky has made andre rublev a piece of art in and of himself he has made that man's life a work of art in and unto itself and he has immortalized him right because people say that this is you know it, people would consider this to be one of the best art house films of all time you know and tarkovsky to be one of the best art house and one and one of the best just cinematic or film directors of all time right as well right so it's it, it's a pretty big deal it's still a big deal but um i was just saying you know it depends on how you look at it, obviously, but I was just saying that it is a bit, you know, it's interesting that he didn't really use that many of the biographical details regarding uh, Andrew Ribola's life. But again, there there probably aren't a lot of them. So it's an interesting situation, to say the least. But um, yeah, I, I still think it's a huge honor. I, I would be honored to have, you know, to have Tarkovsky, if Tarkovsky was still alive, to have him make a movie about me, for example. Uh, I think that'd be pretty fucking cool. So I don't know. But um. Anyway, uh, moving on, this is kind of the crux of this whole episode, so uh, kind of think about this for a little bit, um, Simone, but um, you know, try, try, or, or just try to be as detailed as possible when answering this question, because I think this is the most important question, but um, let me ask you this, Simone, uh, what is this film trying to say, uh, and why do you think Tarkovsky made it? It's a, it's a dark question. It's, it's, uh, I don't know what's, how he, how he, uh, given it, I, I guess, uh, what, uh, what you, uh, after you tackled all the part regarding the, regarding, regarding the scene about the girl, uh, when he started to question all his existence or he is as a religious, uh, religious figure or a painter it just it just appealed to me that um not actually it's just uh it could we could say that it's much more on the religious aspect but we can connect it to the philosophical aspect of things okay cool um what do i what do i think this movie is trying to say and why do i think tarkovsky made it personally so yeah, it does connect more to the philosophical things than it does the the other, you know, whatevers. But um, yeah, I guess how I could structure my thoughts on this. Uh, you know, the movie, like we've been saying, the movie is a Kunstler Roman or a Kunstler Roman uh, before it is a biopic or historical drama or even a period piece. Uh, and a, in a Kunstler Roman, that is the uh, for those of you who don't know. That is the uh, the German term for a story about an artist's progress, right? And so, Bildungsroman is the German term for a coming of age story or a story about the let's say the psychological and personal development of its main character, usually a young person, i.e., child, to teenager, to someone in their early twenties. Um, that that's what that is. A build Bildungsroman is a coming of age story. So, a Kunstlerroman is basically a coming of age story about an artist. Right. And uh, Andre Rublev is a film about the coming of age of its titular figure as an icon painter. Right. So um, and, you know, Tarkovsky said in an interview once, like I said before, that uh, he basically just chose Andre Rublev as his subject because he wanted an artist who had close associations with Russian culture. Uh, but the film was never meant to be a biographical picture in the conventional sense. Uh, ultimately, the main focus is on the events and experiences that shape Andre's artistic persuasions, right? So the the tone of the film is, um, you know, the tone of the film, it, it's it's dreamlike like most, if not all, of Tarkovsky's works. But in this film specifically, uh, dreamlike seems to relate more specifically to subconscious experience. Dreamlike in the sense that it's subconscious 
that it's kind of confusing, that it's um, a bit elusive. Um, and this film makes for a somewhat searing, somewhat challenging viewing experience because of that. Um, the movie of, or sorry, the tone of the movie is dreamlike in the sense that what is being presented appears to relate to Andrei Rublev mostly on a subconscious level, right? So uh, the most important, and, and that, that that makes sense because right because the most important things that because because a lot of the time you know the the most important things that happen to us can be the most difficult for us to uh, to comprehend, uh, and so. It's like how a person struggles under to to understand their own PTSD or trauma sometimes, right? You know, people with PTSD, generally speaking, uh, can tend to retreat into other things uh, rather than confront the issue at hand. Uh, for example, y you know, um, well, I i.e. their their traumatic memories because a lot of the time uh, those memories are like lights that are too bright to look at, you know, and so it hurts to prod and uh, poke at them. And so instead, uh, an unfortunately high amount of people dealing with trauma retreat into things like uh, drug addiction and alcoholism as a way to numb the pain, but uh, more importantly, to uh, avoid confronting those memories, avoid dealing with that um, aspect of, of the post-traumatic stress. Uh, and so Andre's means of, uh, to connect that back to the film, you know, Andre Rublev's means of retreat are uh, religion and uh, silence, and he uses them as a, a bit of a crutch at times, and, and denou you know, uh, denouncing his art. Um, there are a number of ways to view his decision to take a vow of silence, uh, I think. It really just depends on the sensibilities of the individual viewer, uh, you know, whether his vow of silence was the right decision to make or not. It, it ends up being the one that he went with, you know, ultimately, and, and it's the one that he it is a decision that he ends up moving away from by the uh, film's conclusion. So we you know whether or not taking that vow of silence helped his art or hindered it or what have you. I mean, in the end, he he ends up doing he ends up doing more art anyway. He ends up becoming a painter regardless. So it doesn't really matter. I don't think. Um, ultimately, I think this movie was an excuse for. Um, honestly, I think it was an excuse for. Tarkovsky to take a deep dive into uh, the creative process, uh, more specifically the aspects of the creative process that we as human beings have the most difficult time understanding, uh, the elusive nature of artistic and creative inspiration. Uh, I think that's what this movie is all about, the elusive nature of artistic and creative inspiration. Uh, because a lot of what happens throughout the main six cha the six main chapters seems relatively inane and irrelevant to us, the viewers. Six or eight, I, I forgot, sorry. Um, the viewers, uh, the first time watching, let me count actually, sorry. Uh, yeah, it is eight, eight, sorry. So the eight main, ch the, the movie's eight main chapters. Uh, what happens in them seems, again, it seems relatively inane and irrelevant to us, the viewers, and irrelevant to within the context of Rublev's life personally, because again, a big part of it is that he's not actually at the center of a lot of the action a lot of the time, although it does relate to him. Um, and that's because it relates to him as an artist. And so, yeah, I, again, you know, the fact that this is a movie centered around Andrei Rublev is almost irrelevant when it comes down to it. You know, uh, I believe it was either Paul Schrader or uh, Richard Linklater who once said that uh, every biopic or biographical picture film is, is really more a story about the director or the screenwriter or whoever made it themselves than the actual person that the movie is about. Uh, Mishima, for example, was as much about the uh, real life Yukio Mishima as it was the director, Paul Schrader. Uh, so I think in a lot of respects, uh, Andrei Rublev is a film about Andrei Tarkovsky's uh, creative process. And, and artistic existence. Um, I think this can be said for almost all his films. Uh, take Nostalgia, for example. You know, whereas Nostalgia is essentially about the cultural homesickness uh, Tarkovsky would feel any time he left Russia, that's what inspired him to make it, anyway. Uh, Andrei Rublev is about the elusiveness of inspiration, you know, uh, which I'm assuming is something uh, Tarkovsky was contemplating over uh, at that point in his career, i.e. during the time in which he was making this film. Uh, it's also interesting to note that the protagonists of both, uh, Nostalgia and Andrei Rublev share a name with their director, you know, everyone is an Andre. uh, whether Andre is a, you know, whether Andre is a common Russian name or not, it, whether, whether Andre is a common Russian name and therefore irrelevant to my point or not, I would still like to make that point and think that, uh, Tarkovsky is saying something very bold and blatant. And poignant about uh, what is what it is to be an artist by making two films in which the protagonist uh, shares his name. Uh, what he could, what he, uh, and, and what he would be saying about art, I'm presuming, of course, is that uh, it can't help but connect to the artist themselves. Art cannot help but uh, come back to the artist in the end, no matter what. Right? Uh, no matter how distant the subject matter is from 
the artist's personal life, uh, when all is said and done, everything comes back to the mind that conceives the art, right? The mind from which the work originates from, from which the work originates, sorry. Uh, but yeah, that's, I think that's what this movie is about. I, I think it's about the elusiveness of, uh, artistic and creative inspiration. And I, I also think it's about, um, how it, all art eventually comes back to the artist. That, that's the main thing anyway. I mean, there are other themes too. It's also about, uh, let's say, religious and ideological uh, hypocrisy. It's about the dangers of uh, good intentions. It's about the dangers of institutionalized thinking. It's about um, the need for creative freedom and, and about the need for uh, total, 100% unfiltered um, you know, creative expression. It's about how an artist should be able to, to do whatever they want. It's about how people should be able to be free and to do whatever they want whenever they want. You know, they, they shouldn't be brought down by their environments or by their circumstances or by, you know, the thought police or whatever. They, they should be able to be who they are whenever they want to be. They should be able to be themselves at any given point. And that's really what it's about. Uh, and is there anything you'd like to add to that, uh, Simone? What do you think the movie is about? And, uh, uh, you know, what do you think... Um, Tarkovsky is trying to stay, say through it based on what I've said and, you know, just all of that. What, what do you think? What are your thoughts? Yeah, I agree with you. All that you said that, uh, artists, uh, artists much more, it gets back to the artist itself because, uh, uh, even though, um, art is based on some inspiration or something, um, there's, Because even though art is based on some inspiration, there's uh, there's what? Sorry. Uh, the inspiration, even though your uh, the art is come come from some inspiration, it's still uh, it's it's still reflect on your own interpretation about it. Uh, the artist is still have some touches on it. Um, it gets back to the artist that um, given this movie is based on life of some Andre. Um, it's still uh necessarily said it's it reflects more about more on the directors uh and the Traborski. uh it's much more uh reflects more on the on the on the author or the artist itself that yeah even though it's it's based on some lives it's just it still gives his touch on it was based on his own understanding or how he wants to, to portray this kind of movie or his life. Yeah, there there are a lot of things that we can get into this uh, this movie, just like any other form of art, that it depends on how you will... There are a lot of um, point of views that you can look into to get a, a lot of... Um, to, to better understanding art is... Uh, it, 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 it's complex that you know, it differs uh, person to person now. Uh, how you will look at things or how you will take things. Yeah. But um, mostly art is um, kind of based on the other's point of view, the artist itself points of view that the, the, the much more point of view that she wanted, that art wants to portray is much more based on what the, uh, the artist wants you to see. Uh, and it comes to the second hand or what you're trying to see or, or the point of view that you want to focus on. Right. And that's the other side of art. You know, it's like the artist, uh, everything always comes back to the artist. It, it, with, when it comes to art, everything always comes back to the artist it, themselves. But it, it's also true that on the other side of that, you know, the viewer, the consumer, or, you know, that the RT or uh, the person consuming the art, right? The viewer, the appreciator, the reader, what, whoever, you know, the, the audience, the, the viewer themselves, let's just say the viewer for the sake of simplicity, right? The viewer, they they tend to. It's like, uh, what's a good like, what's a good quote? Like Star Wars, for example. Star Wars in the Empire Strike, Strikes Back when um, Luke Skywalker is uh, going into the cave to uh, to face his fears. Uh, he before he does that, he asks Yoda, you know, what is in the cave, and and Yoda tells him back. He says, whatever you bring with you, right? And so it that's what art is. Art is like the cave, you know. It's like you. You kind of, uh, I mean, but it's not necessary. That that might be a bit of an oversimplification, right? Because of course the artist does have to put work in to make the art what it is, right? But that is half of half of the artistic experience, I would say. The viewer half of the art, the, the viewer's half of the artistic experience is you come into something, you know, with everything that you you've experienced, you know, all your experiences, all your biases, all your thoughts, whatever, all your opinions, 
whatever, you know, your preferences, all of that. You, you come into it with all of that. You carry all of that in and then you, that, that interacts with whatever the, the, the art is itself. And so that, that will shape your opinion of it. That will do everything for, you, you know, that, that, that's, that's what it comes down to, I guess. And yeah, it is complex and it's kind of hard for me to articulate off the spot right now. I should have written this down, but I, you know, I should have wrote this, written this. Yeah. I, sh I should have written it down, but, um, yeah, I, I didn't think of it <laughs> until now. So this kind of on the spot and we are kind of coming into like almost what are we in like two hours, three hours? I don't know, but we, we, we've been doing it for a while. So I'm kind of getting a little, yeah, you know, I'm getting that kind of, you know, fatigue. I, I could keep going, but I, it's a tough thing to talk about, I guess. Let's just say no excuses. It's a tough thing to talk about and I don't know exactly how to articulate it. So, um, there you have it, right? It is elusive, and that, that's why a movie like this is important, because it's literally about that kind of elusive nature of, our, of art, right? Uh, just art, not, not only artistic experience or, or inspiration, but just art itself, right? Just art, the thing, art, you know, the abstract concept. Um, and it is hard. It, it can be a bit abstract. It can be a bit elusive. It, it can get away from us, you know? It, it can get a little, it can fall a little too, uh, too far out of our, you know, range of whatever experience and, and information, knowledge, awareness, comprehension to uh, to be fully again to be fully comprehensive so or comprehensible sorry so uh yeah there you have that um last few questions uh simone well is there anything you'd like to add to that before i move on but we just have a couple more questions and then we'll close out uh, we already covered the that part for the best thing that we can do for that part now Sure. So, uh, la uh, second to last question here. Um, in the movie, in the film, what which characters are good and, and which are bad, and um, are there any characters in the film at all who are not uh, morally ambiguous in some way or another? Because I th I noticed that was something interesting. That that was something that stuck out to me in particular when I was watching this. Is that none of the, the all, all the characters are are nuanced. They're all complex. You know, none of them are really um, good or or bad. But I wanted to know what your opinion was on that. Uh, how how do you see it? Uh, I see the more the characters, it's much more the, it's not um, actually more on the language, but there it's, I see those characters attired to their culture or the context that they're into. I guess that, I don't know, they're, uh, they're, they're, they're up under something that, um, uh, what their character is all about, but, um, I guess the characters are what the characters are really they are or, or how they really should be portrayed in another way, or how complex they are. I guess that uh, not only the, but I guess that the one thing that um, the the particular thing that I noticed that uh, make the character the characters effective is that um, the the culture, the background of their the background of each character, or why they act such way, or why they so yeah, uh, um, some of the characters are we can say that uh, they're primitive. That they're it's it was said in the 15th century, so there's not much uh, uh, improvements uh, or inculturation or something that had happened during those times. It's just uh, it's much more more on the laid back uh, laid back uh, aspects or how they do things. Yeah, um, personally, about the characters, yeah, they're, for me, they're, they're effective the way they are. I really like the way that they are portrayed. It. Yeah, yeah, so do I. And, and you're right, like, I mean, well, I don't know if we're, we're right when we say this, but I agree with you, anyway. I, I agree with you, yeah, yeah, uh, I, I think all the characters, they are, they're all inhabitants of a chaotic universe, right? Uh, perhaps a, a fallen universe, you know, the, the term the fallen universe or the fallen world, rather. Uh, it, it has to do with, you know, a lot of other poetry, a lot of English poets from like uh, this, the 18th century and all that, the romantics and all them. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it's a world that has fallen from the graces of God, you know, uh, and the uh, human humanity has been pushed out of Eden, right? Humanity has been pushed out of Eden, like in uh, Milton, let's say, Satan in, uh, in Milton's... Um, uh, Paradise Lost. Wait, what am I trying to write? Paradise Lost, right? Yeah, I, God, I, <laughs> I'm not equipped for this right now. Sorry. But yeah, I think John Milton's Paradise Lost about Satan, how he gets kicked out of heaven and, you know, how people, humanity gets kicked out of heaven eventually, basically gets kicked out of Eden and now they're, they've got to suffer. Um, 
everyone in this movie is flawed, right? Uh, th th there is no good and evil in, in this film so much as there is uh, kindness and cruelty, and um, everyone, every, everyone, every human being in this is capable and subject to both, and that can be said about human beings in real life as well, all of us, right? We're all capable of being kind, we're all capable of being cruel, you know? And we're all subject to both of those uh, emotions or what have you, right? Um, those forces, let's say. Uh, and they're not necessarily good or and evil. They're, they're, they're the practical equivalent. They're the everyday equivalent of good and evil. Good and evil are abstract concepts, but kindness and cruelty are, are you know, they're, they're human traits, let's say. Um, Tarkovsky, you know, ultimately Tarkovsky, uh, he ends the film on a, a note of hope, right? Uh, his thesis appears to be that art is what redeems us. You know, art is our ultimate salvation. Uh, and although or, or art is just our salvation, art is our salvation, um, although the film features the Christian faith and Christian imagery prominently throughout, uh, it is less about religion and more about art, or perhaps even art, perhaps it's even about art as a kind of religion, you know, as a form of religion, in the sense that it ha in the sense that art has the ability to change us if we're willing to give ourselves away to it, you know, because we are, hu as human beings, we're capable of producing art, you know, no other animal can really do it in the same way that we can. We are capable of this sort of self-expression that is unique to us as a species, and, and that's important, and it, and it keeps us from being animals. It keeps us from, you know, staying in the dark too long. It, it, it is what transcends us. You know, it is what self, it is what redeems us. It, it is what Tarkovsky seems to be saying, and that's what I would agree with as well. It's a sentiment that I would share. Uh, you know, ultimately, the heart, the world is the world's a harsh place. You know, it's not a fun place. The universe doesn't give a shit about us. It was not made for our comfort, right? So, uh, and, and some people can handle that harshness. They can they can accept that fact, uh, the, the 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 indifference of the universe, uh, much better than others, right? Uh, but but ultimately, it, it serves one better. It does one more good. Uh, it's like what Cyril said. It's what Carell Kirill said, right? To uh, Andre, it, 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 it's what Kirill's example is. You know. Uh, proves in the film anyway and probably in, in real life like let's just be honest this is pretty common sense stuff but it's good to think about it you know because we take a lot of our we take a lot of conventional we take a lot of human wisdom for granted let's say uh we get you too used to it you know it's like a mother's love it, it eventually becomes a bit too we, we get so used to it that, that it kind of becomes invisible after a certain point um but yeah ultimately it, it serves a person better it serves one better uh, uh whatever the world to to ex to, to accept whatever the world throws at you, at you with grace, right? To take it with grace and work to rise above it, right? To work to be better than it, to be better than the bad, right? Um, to, to rise above. Uh, and that's what Andre and Boris do through their respective creative endeavors, right? Creating the bell allows Boris to transcend his depressing, uh, hopeless uh, personal existence. And uh, Andre's icon painting allows him to move beyond the debilitating loss he experienced at the church during the Totter Raid. So uh, that that's really what it comes down to. Um, is there anything you'd like to add to that, Simone? Yeah, I agree with you. That uh, everything that you said. That, that yeah, that yeah, that uh, it seems that uh, Andre's Andre Roblov is uh, it's uh, it's more on um, he's a monk. It's he's supposedly a, a religious icon. But uh, this movie uh, explore. I like that the movie doesn't uh, explore much on the on the religious aspect. I guess it 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 balances the things that they it it really did a good job on balancing the things that uh, it people can see this um can see everything that uh that uh, the that the movie is trying to portray in a political way, but also they can see it. Uh, in a religious way, it just it goes both ways. That it depends on you and how you will look at things. That it it wasn't just focus on one thing. I guess that what I like about this it it's complex. That it really it reflects what art really means. That um, it's really the art is art. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And not that there's necessarily anything wrong with religion or anything. You know, I'm I'm a Catholic. So, but um, yeah, I, I liked that it wasn't all just about religion. I like that it was about religion and art and faith and spirituality and all, and all that all, all across the board, I suppose, and in a more universal broad sense. That that's that's really what I enjoyed most about this film, I would say. If I had to narrow it down to one thing. But uh last last question um Simone for our discussion. Uh how how does uh Andrew I, I know we talked about this already, but like let's just let's kind of, you know, hone on it for the very end. Um 
How does how does Andre Rublev compare to uh, the other Tarkovsky film we've seen and covered on this show so far? Uh, Nostalgia. You know how how do the two compare? If you had to compare them. Yeah, and just like you said, it's just um, apple comparing apple just to oranges, but it's not that way. I guess that I will uh, I will compare this one on the on how how the director. Um, this one is set and was made in nineteen sixty, released in nineteen sixty six, and Nostalgia is uh was released on nineteen eighty three. I guess that we can see the the improvements. I guess that they say that um uh the uh, it's not actually the the improvements. Uh, we can say on the technical aspect that he improved along the way, but um uh, I could say that uh. What I like about the, the story that he had made is just that there's still um, his character. It's just uh, it's just the reflection of how he wanted to uh, to th- to see things or what the audience is um, trying to see uh, his movie. What I like another thing that I like is just um, his movie. Uh, it's not just uh, something that uh, that was made for a. Uh, uh, for a wide range of for for public viewing, I guess that it 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 doesn't appeal um uh, right ha- right away onto the public or the audiences that whoever sees it that oh I would like to see this one. I guess that you need to what make this um uh, uh this movies made more connection to the audience is that, that you need to give uh, to adjust or you made adjustments for things to get into to understand this uh this film and then uh that that's what i like about it that is um uh, you will set foot to to get a connection into this one um uh, uh, we could say that um uh, this one this one is much more we can there what i like about his film is also uh is it it's complex as the way it is that there are a lot of things that as I guys said earlier, that um, that we could that he could that he could also that he could only focus on the uh, religious aspect of the movie, but um, we can. But he did a great job on portraying this in how complex the the subject uh, how the subject was, and also in the nostalgia. There are a lot of things that we can get from there. There are a lot of there are a lot of things that we can get or something that we can reflect on just like uh, they get in this one for example the politics and the religions or something that we can uh, get into but it's much more on the reflection of how the the director wanted to see the how he see things or wanted to to bring us to his words or the words of his imagination Right. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And um well for me personally, I you know Andrei Rublev was clearly made at the uh the height of uh Tarkovsky's artistic and intellectual uh, achievement, you know. Uh this here is Tarkovsky in his prime in this film. Uh not not that late Tarkovsky is bad or anything. Uh it's just better for me personally to see him here. You know, we still still with plenty of uh, creative energy and youth and he he isn't as fatalistic and longing as he was in Nostalgia. You know, um, but but that being said, the the two films, I I think I actually think they have a lot in common. I I thought about it a little bit, and I think they have a lot in common. Um, upon further reflection, uh, they are both about art. They are both about artists, uh, and, and they both provide something. You know, they both provide somewhat vague, but ult- ultimately fundamental looks or, or windows into the inner intellectual lives of their protagonists. Uh, they both spend a lot of screen time on the supporting cast, even though at the end of the day, the protagonist still remains the main subject. And both also seem to be very autobiographical in nature, by the way. Both films are very autobiographical, at least to, to me. Uh, because like Ingmar Bergman, uh, Andrei Tarkovsky is a very personal director, right? His films are very personal in nature. Uh, they are his passion projects. They're not, you know, they're not necessarily products that are meant to, uh, you know, appeal to a mind, a, a, a mainstream, widespread audience. Uh, but in so being, uh, personal films in nature 
uh, they actually end up becoming more universal as a result, I feel, because you can see what parts matter to the person. And you can understand the subjective on an objective level, if that makes sense. You know, like if there's a bias in it, it's like it tells you more about the world and, and life and how, I guess, things work than it does anything else, if that, that makes sense. Um, so, yeah, you know, that, that's that's what I... I, I I like it a lot. I like it. And I'll I'll end by saying a bunch, I'll read you guys all a bunch of quotes that I my favorite quotes, some of my favorite quotes from the movie. Um and I'll just I'll read them all out. I, I I don't know. I didn't um put exactly what characters said what or anything. I'll just I'll read them. Uh and so let's just let's do it, you know. Uh you can grasp the very essence of everything of everything if you name it correctly. Uh here's another it must be a disease when a man tells lies and can't stop. Uh, here's another. It is only from praying that your heart can come from the visible to the invisible. Here's another. Uh, something goes wrong, or you get tired, and then you meet somebody's eyes and feel like you have received communion and feel better. And I feel like, you know, watching these movies is like a form of communion in and of itself. You know, you, it's an experience that you share with everyone else who has ever watched it before. And also one that you share with the director himself, too. And the characters, of course. So, so yeah. Uh, here's another. Uh, and you could maybe say that about all art in general, by the way. But especially with uh, Tarkovsky. Kar 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 Tarkovsky takes that concept and runs with it uh, like a madman. You know, and it's great. He does like a whole merit. He does a triathlon with it, let's say. Uh, here's another. Uh, life, live, begin, or sorry, here's another, live between forgiveness and your own torment, uh, here's another, it's self-disgrace, he wants his sin to always be with him, here's another, it's a sin not to use God's gift, and here's the last one, uh, do you want to take your talent to the grave? I liked all of those, uh, and those, those stuck out to me the most. Uh, so Simone, uh, before we go, I'm gonna give you, you know, the last couple minutes or so to say whatever you want that you know anything that you might have not have been able to said to sorry not have been able to say uh earlier in the podcast is there anything you want to add to anything that we've talked about already um feel free the floor is yours uh whenever you're ready yeah um yo this is a uh, uh just to summarize all and i say that it's just uh this movie is something that uh it's not actually it's not just this movie. It's just uh, uh, same with the nostalgia movie that uh, we have matched all his uh, Andrei Tarkovsky's uh, works. It's just uh, it's just a different kind of experience to to adjust, or you made an adjustment to an art to get into to to get uh, to get the the universal experience that everyone could get. Uh, get from it when you but but you need to adjust first and that's what make it unique uh, it's just a uh, what sets the connection um uh, really good it's just um it just it just it reflects how complex art is or how wonderful it is that um uh people can get into the same um realization just as we did and then it could um, appeal to other people that the way that the uh, the authors uh, what the artists want to portray to us is just uh, I'm looking forward for more of his works. Okay, cool, and uh, that, that's it for the video. Hope you guys enjoyed. Uh, subscribe if you did, and we'll do more in the future. So uh, there's there's one last uh, major Tarkovsky film to cover, uh, The Sacrifice. So we'll cover that soon, and then we'll also do all. Of, we'll do two of uh, our Tarkovsky student films because that's those are the that's all we have available. But um, yeah, you know, maybe in the future uh, I'll get a Criterion Channel subscription, and then we'll be able to watch everything from there. But yeah, uh, hope you guys enjoyed. Uh, again, subscribe for more, and and that's all. Uh, stay tuned. See you in the next one. Uh, peace.